Yeah, hope you enjoyed our networking session and had the opportunity to meet some pretty amazing people. We are now going to kick off our formal program. I'm pleased to share a few housekeeping items as we begin. We have five amazing sessions for you this afternoon. We will be taking only four minute breaks in between each session. This will hopefully give you a chance to do some stretching, grab a snack, um, a drink, whatever you'd like, but it's only four minutes long. We aim to create a very interactive and dynamic experience today. Please use the chat function to submit your questions in real time, and we will aim to address as many as possible throughout our sessions. We invite you to share your experience on social media and help us create some incredible buzz using the hashtags at area X underscore O and hashtag IWW 2022. We are recording our entire event today and look forward to sharing today's event content more broadly to maximize the impact across our community. It is now my pleasure to introduce Naomi Marisawa DeCoben, Managing Lawyer of MDK Business Law to introduce our first session. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and also Sonia and Michelle for this opportunity to be a part of this very exciting final IWW 2022 event, Women During Driving the Smart Mobility Revolution. So um, as participants in the International Women's Week Strategic Initiative since 2019, our whole wonderfully diverse team at MDK Business Law is really excited to be part of this uh, wonderful International Women's Week once again. And um, as a law firm that works every day towards supporting the success of entrepreneurs and knowledge-based businesses, including those led and owned by women founders, uh, we've shared so many great moments of joy, but also challenges as we work with them on issues relating to their business launch, ownership and commercial issues, governance, regulatory compliance, tech transfer, I mean, the list goes on. So this year, we've chosen to expand our support of Invest Ottawa's several worthy programs and become the newest sponsor of Area XO because it is really our core belief that the strongest results and the most inclusive, innovative progress can be made when there's platforms and forums like this where we have open and frank discussions, the sharing of knowledge, amongst diverse participants in various industry segments. So this afternoon, please let us all take this very precious time and opportunity to acquire inspiration and insight from the women leaders that are here in the nation's capital and from around the world, uh, including from the two visionary leaders that uh, we will, uh, who will be hosting our opening keynote fireside chat. I am really honored today to introduce Risha Sahay, who sets the industry decarbonization agenda for the Secretary General of the United Nations as part of the climate action team. Within this role, Risha influences the key political and strategic considerations for heads of state and for CEOs. She's she's incredible. So previously at the World Economic Forum, she established and led a portfolio of sustainability initiatives. She's also been selected to be on the ultimate list of women transportation leaders. I can't wait to hear from Risha. And Risha is joined today by another amazing person, Manjula Selva Raja, CBC's national tech journalist and columnist. Following their fireside chat, we're going to hear special concluding remarks from Rachel Petro, uh, business operations st uh, strategist from Area XO. I'm nervous, I'm excited, but I am so looking forward to welcoming Risha and Mandela to the stage. Thank you, Nancy for that lovely, lovely introduction. Richa, it's so good to see you. How are nice. you? Good, really good. Thanks so much, Manjula. It's been um, a few days since we last connected. And I see yeah, you yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what? Naomi whispered something to me, and it's going to be a tough question. I'm going to start off with this. Uh -huh. right? um, I hear you're part of a classic rock band. <laughs> let's, let's start there before we get into the important issues. 
tell me about the classic rock band. I was told I'm supposed to talk about mobility. I don't know who slipped this information out, um, <laughs> but you you caught me there. I Yes, I'm part of a classic rock band. We do a lot of cover songs, actually, and perform mm -hmm. uh, in New York, everywhere, um, a lot of different pubs and bars, and it's just a lot of fun. I have sing songs from the 60s to the 2000s, and um, I just... I perform so that people can sing, dance, and have a good time. And is it is it a little bit of, of just sort of the release for you, where you find your balance? Absolutely. You know, I grew up um, I grew up as a singer. I learned a lot, um, and then I learned classical music. And you know, in uh, in sort of typical Asian family form, I had to do it really, really well, and it it became almost a big project for me. So now mm. I have to sort of take a step back, go more into public policy, and et cetera. I'll tell you, tell you more about my life, but uh, that is it is separate, this other richer that um, I engage in that does things very, very differently, holds a very different persona. It's a great, great release. And I think it's I think it's important to realize that we are all many things, and that that different experiences can can bring a cer certain amount of creativity and intelligence to to the other things that we do. So let's talk about your career journey. Walk mm -hmm. us through the journey. What what drew you to this particular area? This this intersection of automotive and climate action. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Manjula. I'm before I begin and share my story. I just really want to. Thank you all. Thanks and thank Invest Ottawa and Women in Automotive Technology and yourself, Manjula, for inviting me. I, I really believe um, all of the women here are inspiration and I'm truly honored to be uh, to be asked to speak. Um, I, I want to also say that today my, the views are my own and I'm I am not representing any organization. Um, and so with that, let me start by uh, sharing where I stand today. So I am a, an expert in the climate action team of in this executive office, office of the Secretary General at the UN. Uh, as you must be reading, the Secretary General is very, very busy these days um, doing a lot of work around uh, the war in Ukraine, but also speaking a lot about uh, climate action and climate change as it relates to the war in Ukraine. And so all of the work that goes behind is his sort of advocacy or high level advocacy is done by by a small team of experts is where I sit. And, you know, I spend most of my days leveraging his political capital, his platform to um, to draw attention to how grave a uh, situation uh, we are in and really with that um, motivate and influence leaders and uh, heads of states to do more. A lot of my work is is research and and uh, being able to write speeches that will change people's minds and, and hearts. My journey though towards um, sustainable mobility was feels a little bit like an unconscious one, but I believe it. It um, I've been working towards it all my life. I mm -hmm. was born in New Delhi. Uh, I was raised and grew up in Manila, Philippines, and I then spent most of my young adult life in New York City. And I, I like to joke that I believe I only like gritty, polluted cities and, <laughs> and live there. Busy cities, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and take up a real big challenge of you know solving for the, the hardest cities and their urban challenges. But growing up in, in India and the Philippines, you know, I I really saw and understood this desire to mark your success by buying a luxury vehicle or by consuming, mm -hmm. you know, uh, consuming luxury products or imported products or, and, and so on and so forth. And really sort of this overconsumption was a mark of your success. And I, yes. as, as a human being, I understand that, but something about that reckless overconsumption didn't sit right with me. And so I came to New York to study, did my master's at Columbia University, where I really wanted to study how economic growth and this relationship with emissions growth can be reversed. So they don't have to go hand in hand. Can they actually change? And so I, I researched with the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency and then uh, came to the World Economic Forum where I spent most of my time um, there. And one of my first projects in the mobility team was um, 
not by any any sort of uh, certainly because I was Indian, I was asked to set up a project in India mm. to um, accelerate electric mobility there. And the real notion was that if things can work in India, they can work in many, many, many places. And and it's true. Um, I you know we saw that um, through smart policy making and incentives and investments, you can turn. Um, a large country around as well. I, I distinctly remember being at the annual meeting in Davos and being in this small room of um, CEOs that are all men, of course, and there were um, CEO of Mahindra, CEO of Volkswagen and others, and just me having to present and persuade these um, uh, CEOs to partake in this coalition to uh, accelerate EVs in, in India. And, you know, the, the, it was a daunting moment for sure, but I think those are the types of moments where you have to step up and say, you know what, they're not used to seeing this, but I'm going to be here and they can't let me not do this. So uh, thankfully we had a really um, powerful coalition and today we have a lot of investments in uh, charging infrastructure due to that, um, due to that coalition. And since then, then I was brought into this team where I stand now and do a lot more at the same time, do a lot more of engagement with governments, where previously at the World Economic Forum, I did a lot more with the private sector. Now I'm working with much more with governments. And yeah, it's um, I spend most of my day being aggravated at the where the world stands today and, and some of my days um, feeling optimistic when people actually do. Uh, really good thing. So that's where I, I, that's been my short story, short journey so far. And uh, I hope, I hope I can hear from other people as well about their journeys. What's well, interesting because I was reading um, the IPCC report recently, and there was a, a statement in there that the chair made that I thought was fascinating. You know, the chair said, we have, uh, I, I know his last name is Lee, his first name escapes me now, but mm -hmm. You know, one of the statements he made is that that we have the know-how and the technology to be able to make change, uh, mm -hmm. to to be able to keep temperatures, you know, to 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 make sure that global temperatures remain um, or the warming remains yeah. at just under 1.5 degrees. Yeah. But but what I wanted to get to is really talking about the impact that climate change will have on women. Yeah. I mean, we are chatting, it's so close to International Women's Day. Yeah. Can you walk me through that, what that impact yeah. will be specifically on women through the yeah. world? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked this question because we, we often don't think about just how grave an impact this would have specifically on women. So mm -hmm. um, firstly, as research shows that people the marginalized communities and, and vulnerable people are the most likely to have the greatest impact on climate change. But specifically, you know, 80% of people displaced today due to climate change are women, 80%. And when you think about, you know, just where the wealth and power stands, you know, 70% of the 1.3 billion people who are in under poverty, are living in conditions of poverty, are women, 70% of them. And then when you think about, you know, you know, sectors like agriculture, 50 to 80% of the numbers that of food production is done by women, but only 10% of land is owned by women. So what I'm trying to say here is that women are already at a, at a marginalized and a vulnerable state um, in sectors that will be affected by climate change and are already um, likely to be you know, their existing marginalization keeps them from being able to adapt when climate change or as climate change shifts and in, in very unpredictable ways. And that's a scary thought because if you don't have decision-making powers, how, how do you then get to swiftly move from or adapt and mitigate uh, climate action? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, you know, truly a, a difficult um, issue. And Another very important issue to raise is due to an added stressor, especially in poorer parts, um, the, the rate of domestic violence and sexual intimidation, et cetera, really spikes in those moments. This happens in war zones, but certainly is also happening due to climate change. So, so the, it's, it's a huge, huge uh, problem. 
but this isn't distant from you and I, Manjula. This is, you know, the same marginalization or lack of decision-making power applies to us as well. If we are not in leadership roles, how will we um, redirect the ways companies should should perform in a climate crisis scenario, right? So, so this sort of lack of this, even for professional uh, women, this unpredictability of climate change will affect those who are more vulnerable. And so I, I think, you know, for me, women's engagement in this uh, in this challenge is deep, deep, deeply important, not just because women are good at, you know, more conscientious and so on, but just truly because we need those who are vulnerable to have a say and a seat on the table. The people that are affected to have uh, affected more than others, perhaps, to, to exactly. have a seat at the table. Now, we know that we have to make some really bold changes to meet um, mm -hmm. net zero goals. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of what those transitions could look like. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm really happy I'm speaking on this this um, on this platform, especially to Canada. And you know, I was doing a little bit of research before this, and I was. It struck me that you know Canada <clears throat> is one of the is the second most affected uh has is having the sorry let me say that again so it is canada's um warming is twice uh, the global rate on all of the countries it's the warming rate is twice more more than the global average and it's three times more than those in the north so you know i'm sure sitting there you have already seen just the grave impact that's happening to Canada and in your day-to-day -day life, but this has to be addressed very quickly. But you know, it, it isn't a country-by-country -country issue. It is truly a um, inter um, intergovernmental uh, challenge and something that requires collective action and recognizing a common goal, but to some extent differentiated responsibilities. And so, emerging markets really, really need to take a step forward. So what is this? What do what bold changes do we need to make in order to get to net zero by 2050? Well, firstly, you know, as you mentioned just three days ago, the new IPCC report came out, mm -hmm. and the picture um, painted is is bad. Is you know the climate scientists are warning that if we don't shift the way we are um, acting now, we will be more than double the 1.5 degrees that is our goal and was set at the Paris Agreement, more than double that that really by 2050. But what that really means is terrifying storms, disappearing islands and and poles and you know water shortages and food shortage, etc. It's it that really when when we think about 1.5, we are talking about the tipping point where you know on it's a tipping point that can lead to cascading um, and irreversible uh, shocks to the climate. Um, but I, I, you know, so to get there, uh, to keep the 1.5 degree alive, uh, we need to, in the next, by 2030, we need to reduce carbon emissions by 45%. And the, the upside to this is, this is possible, as you said in the mm. IPCC report, this mm -hmm. is possible because there is technologies uh, that are uh, being invested in, the rate of, rate of um, investment in those solutions has really risen. The awareness level has definitely increased as well. But we cannot get, um, we cannot stop now. We have to only accelerate uh, further. And the other issue is sometimes we think 2030, oh, that's really far away, or 2050, that's you know my grandchildren. But actually, action needs to happen now in order okay. for, for us to be set up for 2030. So that sort of um, long term view with short-term action is something that we're still struggling with um, at, at the moment. So really keeping an eye on reducing 45% of emissions by 2030 will keep us in the safe zone of 1.5 degree increase of global warming uh, since industrialization. And I think we can get there. I, you know, as I said earlier, I spend most of my time aggravated, aggravated, but my, a lot of my time also just really, really happy to see the kinds of solutions that are coming from innovators mm. and, and where we can go. So, 
Well, it's interesting because, you know, yes, that report, the IPCC report that now you and I are both referring to, uh, mm -hmm. I would recommend that people go try to read a, a summary of it. But what was interesting about it is I actually found that one portion where they talked about poss possibilities mm -hmm. actually uh, quite optimistic. The idea that, that the answers we know the answers, mm -hmm. it's just the willpower that we need. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so let me ask you this, what would you like to see the private sector do in support mm -hmm. of these goals? Because it's certainly, I mean, yes, you know, governments, the federal government here in Canada has, uh, you know, put down some goals and some policies, but we know that we need the private sector to, to play ball here as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, private sector can play a huge role. I mean, it is, we actually cannot do this without the private sector. Uh, one of the areas that I think is first and foremost is that we need to triple our investment in renewable energy. And that is, how, I mean, you know, if you compare ourselves from five to 10 years ago, the price of, of solar and wind was, was multiple numbers higher. Now it's at a place where you could almost see parity between um, the cost of solar and wind to fossil fuels. And that's that's just show, goes to show that when there's will, there's a way. Uh, but that sort of speed of shift towards renewable energy needs to triple. But that doesn't just mean, you know, take the extra money, put it in renewable. It also means moving it away from fossil fuels and coal. And why is that? Because if, you know, fossil fuels and coal plants are very long term assets, right? You don't just use them for a couple of years, you use them for um, hundreds of years. So they become locked in, you know, emitters. And so you want to, there's, you know, want to move away from those that are, are in the pipeline and also move away or shut down the ones that are existing. And this is a very, very political issue. I mean, it is, it isn't easy. It's, it's thousands and, and, and thousands and thousands of people's lives, mm -hmm. generations of coal miners who are very reliant on on the this industry that has kept them uh, kept them afloat. Um, so so really ensuring that this transition isn't abrupt, but it's just it's just for for those and equitable for those who uh, will be affected. But there are you know I'm I'm heartened to say that there are a lot of great road mapping and solutions put in place for that. Um, you know I think it's just sort of political will. To be, to be able to put that out there and convince your, um, you know, your populace that this is the right way to go about it um, is what what's truly needed. Now I know that we talk about change across so many sectors. Mm -hmm. um, we're here uh, because mm -hmm. of of smart mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about that. How important is the transition to sustainable transportation? Mm -hmm. uh, in achieving these goals or to, yeah. towards achieving these goals? Yeah, no, so transportation is an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. Um, and that's partly why I became so um, entrenched in the climate change issue is because of my sort of pension to do something about it. 25% of global uh, CO2 is comes from transportation. Twenty, So a quarter of every... Um, CO2 is because of transportation. This is this and the IPCC report that we, we were both referring to says that if we don't move away, uh, we should be seeing about up to 50% increase of that. So, so basically all of co um, uh, emissions would be coming from transportation. But at the same time, well, that sounds really, you know, we can't afford that at all, of course. But there's also immense innovation in um, in transportation, and especially in the road transport and um, and in the public transport space. I've seen just in the last couple of years just the immense um, innovation in that um, investments that are going in there. Um, I'm I you know I, I advise a um, a VC that has that had a, just a few mobility companies. Uh, electric mobility companies. Now there's a plethora of them just in that from that one VC. So just the interest on in that space is humongous, and that's that's great. And we can see that because the the cost of batteries is also sla getting yes. slashed over the years because mm -hmm. of that. So these are the, exactly, and so that's you know that those are really good reasons to be 
optimistic about this. And if I were to sort of signal where more investment needs to go, I'd say it should be in the shipping and aviation industry mm. uh, sectors where more money needs to go in the production of ammonia, of synthetic fuels that can replace these uh, fossil fuels. And they're not they're not cheap, but they need to be uh, in order for them to be used. So greater demand and uh, needs to be uh, driven towards them. But um, yeah, sustainable transportation is deeply, deeply important to in order for us to achieve our net zero goals. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I should mention, by the way, to everyone, I have a ton of questions for, for Richa, but if anyone else has any, please um, add them on to the comments. I'll make sure uh, that I interrupt my thinking process here and make time for your questions as well. Super important to me. Um, she certainly wants to hear from all of you. One of the earlier conversations we had, Richa, you mentioned this, this thing that stayed with me. I actually thought a lot about it after our conversation. You mentioned that electric vehicles mm -hmm. were infused with this sense of femininity mm -hmm. um, at some point, and that that may have hurt the electric car movement in the early days. What do you mean? No, this is such a fascinating story that I had learned earlier. And it's totally, this is one of the lost histories in the books of lost histories of electric vehicles. So um, I learned that in, you know, in 1897, which is sort of when um, we were moving from horse carriages to automotive, the best selling car in 1897 was an electric vehicle. They were, and this, the largest, and at that time, electric vehicle company uh, this is in the U.S., was making the, was briefly the largest automotive um, manufacturer. So mm -hmm. the history of EVs goes way before, in fact, uh, petrol and gas guzzling cars. And, um, but however, um, because, you know, there are still issues about battery range, et cetera, as we are still, you know, trying to solve for, and a very strong um, petrol um, lobby, petrol gas lobby, uh, powered lobby, really, you know, tried to defame these um, electric vehicles and, um, and also tried to show that there were so many kinks that needed to be, needed to be fixed. So at the same time, sort of petrol um, vehicles, powered vehicles also started to take, to rise up. But what really, you know, what really um, damned it all, unfortunately, was that as it, as the petrol or ICE vehicle started, <clears throat> people started to, the connotation of electric vehicles became, this is a woman's car. And what does that mean, right? Like, um, it's a woman, that doesn't, it's not a bad thing, of course, but back in the day, a woman's car, the association was basic, was saying this can do short trips, can do, um, you know, it's lightweight, it's not very complex, um, you know, women are not good mechanics, so, you know, it shouldn't be too, too complex. And this sort of, it was reliable, but not um, powerful. And, you know, in fact, the interesting story, interesting fact is that Henry Ford gave his wife, Clara, a electric vehicle and not one of his own Model T vehicles. That just blows my mind. Blows I'm my mind. <laughs> deeply entrenched the sort of desire to um, limit, you know, uh, independence by giving big, by giving them electric vehicles. So that truly, of course, uh, then electric vehicle companies could not keep up with the petrol. Um, powered cars, um, the demand for electric vehicles was limited to women, and there were only about 10% at best women, uh, you know, drivers. And there it went, it, it all sort of sort of dwindled until 2003, when um, a few innovators figured out that you can actually recharge a battery. Mm -hmm. And that's when electric vehicles started to come back um, again. So the story, it just, it just blows my mind how far back it goes and how deeply entrenched it is in societal norms. And, and um, I really hope that that, you know, we can, that this is exactly why we need more women in the electric vehicle space so that this sort of male dominated sector doesn't, doesn't set the path for what is come, what is to come next, you know? As it, 
for starters, that story blows me away. I did not know that. I hope someone who's creating a podcast out there who hears it actually decides to uncover all of that because it would make for a fascinating tale. But, you know, I, I think, you know, you've brought it up to that, that, you know, climate change affects women. We need more women involved in smart uh, mobility in the EV movement. And uh, one of the participants here, one of the attendees, um, Suzanne has said, we also need more research dedicated to women's involvement in climate initiatives. They are often included, excluded from the decision-making process. So this is her question to you. Where do you see women um, making that impact? Do you see them at the decision-making stage mm -hmm. or at the implementation stage? And I guess the, the, the larger question is, you know, what is the role that, that women can play here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is a really, really important question. And I, I, I'll i be honest, I don't think there is one answer, right? And there, and my answer changes by the day as well. Mm -hmm. But my in my personal view, I think <clears throat> one of the things we need to debunk is the association of women in you know in the automotive sector or even other sectors is associating women in sort of sales and advocacy and i understand that they are excellent at it right and that is um <clears throat> one can't say is it because women are just naturally better at sales and marketing or advocacy or is it because you know professional society assumes they're good at it and therefore they hire them for that we don't know, but this sort of I, what one of my pleas would be to think of women beyond those two roles. Um, and I'm saying that as somebody who works in advocacy, right? We we need to be seen beyond those roles. And there are many, many good examples. You know, I was I, um, I they mentioned there's a really good list of ultimate women and in, in women in transport. And I was looking through that and there's just in so many powerful engineers, women engineers, you know, there's um, examples like um, Pamela Fletcher, who was the, who was the person who saw the um, Chevrolet Bolt. She's, she was a GM and she saw through the uh, Chevrolet Bolt um, inauguration and launch, et cetera. Now she's with um, Delta Airlines. Mm -hmm. there come there are a lot of uh, women in micro mobility and shared mobility which i believe is just so so important because you can you can solve for evs but you cannot evs will not solve for congestion and um road safety and you know this sense that each person one person should own a one ton uh, car is is so obsolete and it needs to change and there are so many women in the shared mobility and uh, space, you know, Robin Chase is another one who uh, was a CEO of Zipcar and now mm -hmm. with Numo. And there's incredible, so many examples of these leaders who are um, who are really changing, rethinking the way mobility should be done. And um, so, from my my view, is that the role of women is to challenge this existing narrative that that you know vehicles need to be owned by one person and that um, you you know one uh, in, internal combustion engine should be replaced directly with one electric vehicle these things need to be rethought uh, completely and the role of women is to challenge that you know and and i think it's interesting that you say that i think that cars do need that kind of challenge because i remember the first time a couple of years ago it was actually when i was moderating a panel of richard that i heard someone say to me i mean now it's common language but someone said to me you know your car it just sits on the driveway for this many hours mm -hmm. what a what a wasteful asset and i remember throughout that session i kept thinking that is an incredibly wasteful asset. <laughs> so yeah. I, I do think that there is, um, it's almost like from a ground up thinking that mm -hmm. has to address transportation period. Mm -hmm. And it can't just be a, a, about uh, about cars. Yeah. Let me ask you this. If we do want more women in this sector, um, mm -hmm. you know, where and how can we make changes? Like where should we start? Because I'm coming back to that picture you painted of you um, in that room at Davos where you were, you know, you were with all of the CEOs and you were presenting and the other people in the room were men. Mm -hmm. So where do you think we can start to, to, to bring more women into the sector? Yeah. I mean, this would keep all of us up at night. And But one of the things I have to say is forums like this are incredibly 
important to firstly just know that there are women out there in these spaces standing in front of CEOs and just telling them what they should be doing, right? And so we can do that as, as difficult as it may seem, as impossible as it may feel, it is possible. So it's just a belief that you can be a leader in this space is important. And these forums allow us to hear from one another. And I think we need more of these. We also need to advocate for one another um, more vocally. You know, there I had to really, for you know, really look at and research names of different women, uh, engineers or leaders in the space to to think about. You know, what I was going to say today. I shouldn't have to do that. There should be just mm. out. It should be at the tip of everyone's tongue, not just women looking for other examples, but everyone. I think there needs to be much more you know, uh, media around that. And I'm so happy I'm speaking to you uh, <laughs> there. Hint, hint. I'm just, I heard you, each other. <laughs> no, It wasn't yeah. personal. It wasn't speaking for <laughs> no, I, <laughs> uh, I know, and I, I think really uh, also my earlier point that to acknowledge that women are not just in sales and HR and advocacy space, but also across all, um, you know, they're great engineers, they're great product managers, they're great... Lead, CEOs and leaders sort of painting that picture that to move away from this sort of specific view of what women can do that's really important and the last thing here um and again happy to be speaking to invest uh, Ottawa is investors need mm. to make sure that the companies that they invest in have female leadership and most importantly uh, and as importantly uh, board members that are women how will we rethink this mobility, uh, smart mobility revolution if we don't have diverse perspectives and people that come at it from a different uh, viewpoint? So I think there are multi there's just so many things to do, but, um, but we can do them. And one thing I will say, it is not for a lack of education. You know, there are more women engineers, um, you know, graduating than men. So it's not lack of, you know, talent. It's change in perspective of what women can do in this sector. And I think for that, a lot more, um, you know, a lot more awareness need to be uh, drawn around that. It's interesting because, you know, uh, I do think that the to, you know, to be it, you have to see it. Is that the right order? Yes, yeah. to be it, you have to see it. I think. I think that uh, thinking is very important, and I think mm -hmm. that that seeing people like you and some of the other speakers that that are on the session today is really important for women. and mm -hmm. And I'll just read a comment because it's directed to me, but I do find it interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Suzanne has said that uh, this is a comment from Angela. Media often ignores women's narrative and contribution in the climate change initiatives. I think the media should take a step forward to encourage more women journalists to cover these sub subjects. We need more women covering these issues. Uh, by women for women. Um, interesting, a super interesting thought. Uh, I think that we could have a whole discussion on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, Claude has this comment. I, I wanted to put this as a question to you. It's a, a, a comment and a, and a point. Uh, mm -hmm. Humanity has largely failed at reducing emissions during the last couple of decades. Because of that poor track record, shouldn't we focus much more on imagination, creativity, and resources at adapting to a warmer world. We can continue to hope for the better, but mm -hmm. we have a responsibility for to future generations to plan for the worst. Yeah. What would you say to that comment, Richa? It's, it's such an important point, uh, Claude. Thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, <clears throat> as somebody who works in sectoral emissions reduction, I can be very focused on reducing emissions and the sort of forward looking view. But what is so important to recognize is that we've already messed up our planet and we need to adapt. There are places that no longer have islands out there that no longer have the ability to, um, you know, come up with new technologies that will reduce emissions. They have to adapt their current life in order to be um, in order to be able to, <clears throat> you know, survive in, in a uh, changing environment, changing climate. So the, your point about, you know, we really should be focusing on reimagining and 
being creative with how we use our resources, current resources, not just pump money into investments, which I know we need to do, but also rethinking how do I, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis that affects this planet? Can I do it differently? And also keep in mind that there are people out there who have no choice but to adapt. Um, I was listening mm -hmm. to this podcast because I'm a huge podcast nerd. And I was listening to this podcast um, and they were interviewing some people from um, this, from um, Maldives. And it's, it, you know, first of all, whenever I think about Ma Maldives, I'm like, oh, luxury. How, 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 <laughs> yes, that's what I think too. I'd love but. to go there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's, it's a sad situation there. There are, you know, the, uh, I think the government there is, thinking about migrating uh, half of its country to yes. a different planet or to a, sorry, a different uh, island that is more closer to a land and buy land somewhere else. That is, that is a sh deep level of um, adaptation that's needed in order to just survive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so keeping that in mind and that, that, you know, what we put out there has such an immense impact on others who are very vulnerable uh, is in a really important point. So I'm I'm really happy that Claude, you mentioned that you know we need to think not just about mitigating what will come in the future, but also in adapting the way in which we we live today. I think you know I think we can also say that you know just to echo what you're saying is that is that um, that mitigation is possible for some people, and really you know we should say it it's impossible. Yeah. For, for some communities around the world. Um, Suzanne, by the way, uh, makes a comment here. Uh, she says, you make an interesting point, Claude. I agree that we have to begin where we stand and manage to our current reality while we continue to do better. So she's echoing what you're saying, uh, Richa, that, that, we, mm -hmm. that we sort of need to work on all of these strategies together. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I I'm curious, you know, you do work in this really uh, interesting area, the intersection of, of climate change and, and automotive. Tell me about some of the ideas that you see, if we could kind of look forward, what are some of the things that you see that, mm -hmm. that really get you excited and, and optimistic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, for me, you know, I, I will be, I, I'm a big proponent of leveraging or uh, refocusing investments into technologies that are that are inherently good for the planet, right? So, um, and maybe you, every technology has its flaws, but I, what, what I'm really excited to see is how many innovators have come into trying to shift the way we uh, produce and consume energy. And, and also a lot of innovators have been working in, in these mammoth industries like steel and cement mm. who are known to be, you know, very hard to abate. What I'm, what I'm really um, inspired by is that the new generation of innovators don't see these mammoth industries as as impenetrable, but rather they can challenge these uh, sectors by coming up with much more, um, you know, net zero from the get go kind of materials. I'm, I, I think we are still quite far away from completely transforming our our um, energy in you know energy planning but we need to think not just incremental changes but uh, transformative changes so think about you know for example think about building and steel cement transportation sectors all as one integrated system that that um, extracts energy or needs energy and mm -hmm. how do we create these sectoral synergies so that we're not just looking at one energy for transport or energy for building but all as one um, and i'm seeing a lot of that a lot of that kind of cross-sectoral thinking uh, that really um, inspires me um, as well and um, you know there there are many i mean after uber and and lyft there have been many carpooling um, types of or car sharing types of um, platforms, but some of the ones that I really appreciate are the ones that recognize in some parts of the world, like Saudi Arabia and others, where women can't um, are, are not allowed to are not able to 
um, move around as easily. So coming up with solutions that are, you know, a addressing a very specific and, and, and difficult societal issue. And so I've, I've seen, met some innovators who have uh, carpooling specifically for women that is, um, that's, that's been really inspiring to see as well, that simple solutions have go really far. That, that address a variety of issues. Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Um, so I, I'll read one more comment. Uh, Michael Tremblay would, would like to say, I think he said this a few minutes ago, rock band, and apparently he thinks that is very cool. So I think <laughs> we'll pass that comment on. So we have uh, just a, a, a couple of minutes left, probably about four minutes left. I'm mm -hmm. going to make sure that I haven't missed um, any uh, question here. No, I think uh, I think I've addressed most of them. So I'll ask you this. Um, you're speaking to a, a captive audience. Uh, you've been wonderful to, to speak with, by the way. You've put a lot of ideas in my head for sure to think about. Um, if you were to leave us with, with one call to action today, uh, what would it be? Uh, this I, I've been thinking about this a lot. And um, I, think I, I think the challenge with humanity has been myopia and has forever been about myopic gains and short-term gains. And I think I would like all of us, and I do this, tell this to myself as well, think of everything that you do every time you sit in a private vehicle, every time you, um, you know, consume or get deliveries or in your house and every time you use plastic, think of those who are very far away living in Maldives or others, what is the impact your action is having on them? It might be a short-term gain for you to have convenience, but it has a very, very severe impact um, on them. So my call to action for all is to just internalize that awareness that um, when it comes to climate change, your action is can be somebody else's problem. And so we have to think um, think for others and not just for ourselves. Amazing. That's actually, you know, that's I've I haven't heard it put that way, and I think that that's really powerful. You know, I'll just add to that that I that I um, read a book recently, and the name escapes me now, as it always does when I'm in the middle of these rich conversations. It's a book about how. If you look at any aspect of your life, you, you get up on a on a Saturday morning and you go golfing and then you have, you know, brunch with a friend and then you come back and you work on your computer. And if you look at each of those activities, each of those activities independently um, will be impacted by climate change, each of those things that you love. And I just wanted to take what you said and present another aspect to say that if if you or your child was to look at that activity, um, mm -hmm. It would be entirely different, and I and I thought uh, I thought that was a fascinating way to look at it. Um, when does your rock band play next? When's the <laughs> next big gig? We can't make it. We'd love to know. I was actually just putting up my set list, so my next performance is on May first. Oh, um, okay. So excited to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely chatting with, with you. Thank you so much. And uh, we've learned a lot and, uh, and hope to have the pleasure of doing this again soon. Thanks so much, Majula. Great. It's been a great pleasure. And thanks to everybody for sending questions, comments as well. Um, uh, this was a lot of fun for me and I've learned a lot from everyone here. And now I'll have to hand it back to Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mangela and Risha. Risha, that was a very powerful message that you left us with. Um, and on behalf of Area X Auto and Women in Automotive Technology, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to both of you for your time today. And Risha, I'm, I can't come May 1st, but I'm hoping to catch you on, on your next debut and in your classic rock band for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, you know, okay. as, as an avid runner and health enthusiast, um, health and wellness enthusiast myself, uh, Risha, I, I truly, you know, appreciate your, your passion and commitment to decarbonization and, you know, a greener, more sustainable future, um, as, as I'm sure many on this call and, and globally do. And I, I was actually, prior to writing this, Last night, you know, I was out for a run and I was um, a diesel truck raced by me and exhaust filled the air. And I just 
I, I took a big inhale and, and I couldn't breathe. And it, as I stood there, just, you know, catching my breath, it, it made me have a deep, you know, sense of appreciation for, for all the extensive work that, that mm -hmm. you're doing. And, you know, the work I see daily being conducted daily at, at area X and, mm -hmm. and in West Ottawa to, you know, drive a, a cleaner, more sustainable and an inclusive future for the next generations to come. And, at the beginning, you mentioned um, that you write speeches to change people's minds and 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 to make a difference. And I truly feel that that this discussion alone has has opened my my eyes to so much. Specifically, you know, the correlation and ties to to climate change and its effects on women. Like I just I didn't even know that. And and it's such such a powerful notion. And with such a large focus on on you know surrounding climate change and, and global warming, you know, the responsibility really falls on all of us to, mm -hmm. to protect the environment. And, and as a young woman in, in this industry, I, I would like to thank you for being an inspiration and um, being at the forefront of women in smart mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel, for those inspirational words and for all your contributions to AreaX.O and Invest Ottawa. And a very special thank you to Risha and Mandela for launching our program in such an impactful way. We will now be taking a brief break and I would like to welcome everyone back um, to our next session for around 1.55 p.m. So enjoy your four minute break. Thank you. Winterland, tell me all your secrets.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that very short break and are ready for our next session, which is driving the safe, secure, and impactful implementation of smart mobility innovations through policy leadership. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Ms. Suzanne Cork, Strategic Market Director for AreaX.O and the moderator for our next session. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I start, I just want to reflect on the fact that this has been such an inspirational session so far. The conversation, the, the folks that are, are contributing to the conversation today, just so inspiring and, and just so wonderful to be part of all of this. So I'm vibrating with excitement and very much looking forward to uh, welcoming you to our panel, exploring policy leadership and how vital that is in the commercialization and adoption of smart mobility innovation. And I'm really honored to facilitate this conversation today with a group of formidable leaders, each bringing a very unique perspective to the discussion. In a moment, I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they do and why they feel so passionately about policy development in the frontier of smart mobility. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment just to tell you a little bit about why I'm so excited to be part of today's discussion. Area X.O, as you've heard, is Invest Ottawa's world-class private and secure test and demonstration facility. We're located on almost 2,000 acres of former federal research farm. We are fully fenced and gated and only 12 kilometers from Parliament Hill, which puts us in proximity of all the universities, colleges, 65 federal research labs, municipal and federal government regulators and policymakers, as well as industry leaders in the areas of telecommunication and mobility. And while we create a safe and secure space to fully test the latest technology innovations, we are also an ecosystem of collaboration. At Area X .O, we sit in that zone between technology innovation and commercialization and adoption of new technology. As an example, we recently collaborated with Transport Canada and the City of Ottawa, among many other stakeholders and entrepreneurs, on a thorough test of the viability of low-speed autonomous shuttles as part of a municipal transportation ecosystem. Through that project, we tested not only how the technology works on city streets, but how citizens interact and feel about riding in an unmanned vehicle and also how to gain acceptance from municipalities and federal authorities for a project such as this. That project led to the development of a framework that we continue to use, and is currently part of another project that we're working on together, focused on using smart mobility to improve the safety of intersections, particularly for vulnerable road users. Throughout these projects, we benefit from an ecosystem of collaborators, including policymakers, which elevate our work from simply testing technology to testing the viability of that technology in real world applications. So without further ado, I invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us about their role and their organization and share with us why they're so passionate about smart mobility policy. Jen, perhaps we'll begin with you. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tisdale. I am the CEO of a cyber research firm named Grimm. Um, we have an embedded system security practice that focuses um, primarily on all forms of advanced transportation mobility, including the infrastructure and ecosystem in which the vehicle will operate. Uh, prior to my time here at Grimm, um, I 
do have an economics and public policy background. I worked um, in my state for the state of Michigan um, through a different administration in the advent of advanced transportation mobility and creating smart um, policy in the realm of mobility transportation, but also in relation to cybersecurity. So again, it's a great pleasure to be here and I look forward to the discussion. Awesome, thank you so much. Joanne? Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joanne Harbuck. I'm a human factors specialist at Transport Canada, and I lead research in the human factors and crash avoidance division, multimodal and road safety. And I work on the human factors side of things. Um, this is where we focus on human interaction with uh, automated vehicles of all sorts, both inside and outside the vehicle. And our, of course, our goal is to improve safety and make these um, usable and acceptable uh, vehicles for people to use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our research projects that we run contribute to the development of guidelines and standards and regulations. And for example, uh, right now, a lot of our focus is looking at um, issues involved with the development of ISO standards, for example, relevant to human machine interface and interaction. So we're looking at areas like driver monitoring systems and how well they work and questions we may have, but also issues where we might want to be able to provide assistance for people in remote in automated vehicles that have no drivers. So looking at issues of remote um, sort of support and assistance that might be possible. So I'm very happy to be here today, and thanks for the invite. Thank you. Elizabeth? Hi, thank you, and uh, thanks to uh, Invest Ottawa for the opportunity to join everyone today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Caputo. Uh, I work at the World Economic Forum, uh, where I've been since 2014. Uh, I handle our work uh, with the U.S. government, uh, but have a particular focus on linking uh, government officials with the mobility sector. Um, working both with the federal US DOT uh, and other federal agencies in the White House, as well as increasingly with US governors and US mayors. Um, prior to my work at the forum, I spent uh, almost two decades in municipal infrastructure finance. Um, I'm based here in New York City, um, but several of our financings were for the New York MTA, the New York State Thruway Authority, and other national transit and transportation authorities. Um, I like to think that my career bridges the global and the local, so I'm also very engaged here in New York City local government uh, and chair a local community board where we've dealt extensively on local transportation issues, uh, everything from building three major bike lanes on major Manhattan avenues uh, to focusing on master plan for pedestrian safety, transit equity issues, and increasingly looking at uh, AVs and EVs and the electrification of the New York City public bus fleet. So I'm really honored to be here today with this great group of experts and look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Stacy. Hi. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. I'm excited to be here with this uh, group of amazing women here. Um, my name is Stacey Balk. I am the Division Chief for the Human Factors and Engineering Integration Division um, at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, as we're known, within the Department of Transportation. Um, I lead a team that's very similar to Joanne's. Um, so we, we work on human factors issues associated with the vehicle. So I like to say, if the human is touching it or looking at it, we're involved with it. Um, so everything related to how you interact with the vehicle kind of falls into the research that we do. Um, like Joanne mentioned, you know, we're looking at human machine interfaces, how people really interact with the vehicle so we can set forth um, rules, policy, and guidelines to make sure that people are making the best decisions possible when they're in their vehicle. Um, so this is really exciting because, you know, the vehicles as they are, kind of conventional vehicles, have a lot of new technology coming into them. And then as we're moving forward in vehicle automation, we really have an opportunity to set forth design in automated vehicles in a way that we just haven't had uh, previously. So we can really put together some solid research and make sure that we're designing vehicles in a way that makes them uh, safe and equitable for everyone to use. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And certainly, you know, building trust in the technology is just such an important part of, of you know, improving or increasing and facilitating the adoption of the technology and, and safety and security, of course, is such an integral part of, of the work that we do. 
But all of you have such an incredibly fascinating background, and I'm sure that our audience today um, would love to hear from you um, just to build context for our conversation, sort of the journey that you've gone through to date within your careers that have sort of led you to where you are today. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always fascinating, I find, because many of us take a very circuitous route when we trace through our careers, and I just think that it's quite fascinating. So I'm, I'm going to ask you if you would reflect on that for, for our audience. So, Joanne, maybe we'll start with you on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, I guess it's funny because for years I thought none of it connected, and apparently it does, actually, which is pretty interesting. So I started off in design school. Um, <clears throat> doing interesting things like woodworking, metalwork, um, using oxyacetylene torches to make jewelry, fun stuff like that. So um, after that though, I went to university and discovered cognitive psychology and just how much we can understand or not what's going on in people's heads and how they do things and how we could make things more effective or efficient or enjoyable. And so that was great. So I stuck around for a bachelor's of science and then I stuck around for a master's and I stuck around for a PhD in cognition. And then I went to National Institutes of Health where I worked for two years doing cognitive neuroscience and really understanding, um, and again, or not, a lot of the really interesting things that go on uh, when things don't function well, when they do function well, things on executive function, stuff like that. So that was great. And then of course, the next logical step is to move to Transport Canada but um, <laughs> that's what happened. And I was thrilled really to find out that the skills that I built and the interests, it was a great place to do this work. It was really nice. So I found home. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. That's amazing. Um, and, and as you say, all the dots do connect. You know, everything leads to something else and provides insight to the next role. Stacy, how about you? Yeah, so um, I I started um, in a, a, a psychology type undergraduate program as well. Um, and I think like a lot of people who end up in human factors and applied research, um, I, I kind of found this place where I was like, well, where, where, this is really interesting, but how do you apply it? Um, and how do I, f I find the real world applications of cognitive psychology and, and really um, adapting where humans perform best into real world design, um, which is where I found human factors um, and, and finished my, my PhD. Um, I dabbled in academia for a little bit. Um, it wasn't the best fit for me. And after that ended up um, working as a government contractor at Federal Highway Administration. Um, so where now I'm focusing on design inside the vehicle, very focused on research um, to design that the environment in which people um, drove. So things like lane markings and signs and how do you make sure that people understand what they're doing um, with their vehicle. Um, and then uh, after that, I moved to NHTSA. So it's been a, a fairly straightforward path once I found kind of my, my niche and, and what I like to do. Wonderful. Jen? It's been an interesting ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I could tell you that there was some grand schematic or plan that I was following, um, but it certainly was not the case. When I was a little girl, things like this were not even in my brain mm -hmm. that it that it was in the realm of the possible, that we would be talking about automated connected vehicles and what that might mean, and certainly not cybersecurity in relation thereof. Um, I started my career um, in a non-traditional way. Um, I was working full-time for the US Department of Justice. Um, I worked in their computer crimes unit at the time as I was going to college for my, for my public policy degree. I knew that in my heart I was a public servant. I still am, uh, contrary to working in the private sector at the moment. Um, but I, I know that there is advocacy work to be done here. And so those are the ties that bind for me and my mission with my company today and where my career has taken me is to know that there is a lot of education that needs to be um, performed in, in the context of public policy, cybersecurity, and advanced technology. And so watching my career evolve from, I worked in the defense industrial base as well. I was a defense contractor. I uh, worked for a nonprofit that helped me educate um, defense contractors to do business with the US federal government. Um, I carved a niche for myself in commercialization of emerging technologies. Um, for whatever reason, I was really good at that. Uh, and I was recruited by the state of Michigan, uh, by, the, by the governor at the time 
to lead their efforts in terms of cybersecurity. He knew I had an economic policy um, background and thought it would be really interesting to blend together his love of cybersecurity with my love for public policy uh, and economic strategy. And so for the state of Michi Michigan, I created um, our economic uh, uh, strategy and position for all things cybersecurity and mobility related. I like to tell people I had the first job in mobility um, in the U.S. anyway, because we created the term, we invented it. <laughs> so it was the straight way to the top. Um, so for all the kids out there wanting to know how to get to the top quickly is you just create the role for yourself and just do it and people will follow you. <laughs> uh, so that so that's the the short of it. Um, but, but working with a team of hackers as I do today was never on the horizon. It was never part of the plan. Um, it is a happy byproduct of the advocacy work and the public policy work and understanding how important it is to make sure that we are protecting the consumers of these products that we're putting out into the world. Wonderful. Thank you. And Elizabeth, how about you? Sure. No, thanks. Uh, look, I um, I got here uh, through a somewhat circuitous route uh, to the forum, but it does sort of summarize my uh, life experiences to date. Um, as I mentioned, I joined the forum in 2014, but had spent um, a lot of my career really trying to bridge the public and private sectors. Um, I am a big believer, you know, I went to business school, um, not because I wanted to be necessarily a CEO of a company someday, but because I was really frustrated with sort of how management in government worked. And I felt by, you know, maybe getting some of those skills, I could help sort of within the system um, and take sort of a um, sort of I don't want to invoke his name, but sort of a Bloomberg technocratic approach um, to government. And so I did work in the Bloomberg administration for for a while, um, building public private partnerships. Uh, and then, um, you know, my career in infrastructure finance, I think, also really taught me again, working with um, city and state agencies um, on how they handle their finances, I think, helped build a skill set for me. And did expose me to um, to the transportation sector in a really uh, unique way. Um, I also think, again, I know I mentioned the sort of bridging the global uh, and the local, but uh, as a woman, especially, I've definitely noticed um, that so many of these jobs and positions um, have been dominated by by men, and it's been really great to see um, here in New York City, in particular, you know, our past transportation commissioner our past, um, you know, US DOT secretary, and I will invoke, you know, the new governor, the, in, the recently elected, I guess, in the last couple of years, governor of Michigan, which is a state we work really closely with. And I know um, we probably share a lot of um, mutual contacts and people in common from that, those experiences. Um, I've really seen women sort of leading on transportation issues, which I think is fantastic. Uh, and uh, again, just to bring it back to the forum, when I started eight years ago, there were, um, we have sort of four major verticals in our mobility sector of work at the forum. It's aerospace, aviation, automotive, and supply chain. When I began at the forum, none of those um, jobs, the heads of those roles were occupied by women. Um, now three of the four of them are occupied by women, which I think um, is just a testament to the incredible work that has been going on and women really stepping up to the plate on, um, on these policy and, and industry issues. And I'm proud to be sort of the person on the government side who's working with them as the connector um, to try to make good things happen. Well, that was very inspiring. And, you know, to be honest with you, I think what that does is it demonstrates to everyone listening, our audience today, and perhaps even to one another, what a rich mosaic of backgrounds that come together to really inform policy decisions, to make them intelligent, make them prudent. We've got, you know, the security aspect, the economic aspect, the, you know, the psychological aspects, so many different things coming together in order to really inform policy. And it was interesting um, in our sort of networking discussions just prior to coming on, um, policy, I know sometimes can seem dry and very governmenty and kind of boring, but truthfully, I think it is one of the most exciting places to be because you're really making a huge difference and you're you're informing how how these these mobility innovations are really coming to the forefront. So 
if we think of the critical role that each one of you are playing within your organizations and just in general, the advancements in the smart mobility industry and, and driving the adoption of these technologies in real world contexts. Um, I wonder if you can reflect on some of the most critical success factors as we take a look at accelerating adoption. I know we've touched briefly on, on the cybersecurity aspect, but I wonder if you can sort of reflect for me in the work that you do, what, what some of the big things are that we need to get right in order to, um, to move mobility forward into, into something that we all are comfortable using every day. Stacy, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, I assume I'll probably have an, an obtuse answer. Um, <laughs> How about <laughs> it? Policy, you know, um, you know and it's a, all of our decisions are really data driven. So what it comes down to is we need to make sure that the, the design feature, the piece of the vehicle, whatever we're specifically looking at is safe and designed well and makes an impact on the roadway. We want to make sure thoroughly that we are saving lives and injuries from um, incidents on the roadway. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, and I think, you know, my group, Human Factors, there's other um, research divisions as well. We all work together to make sure that things um, kind of synergize, to use a, a buzzword, but it's, it's true, um, to make sure all pieces of any part of technology or any component of a vehicle really work well together. Um, to, to improve safety on the roadway. And that's really what it comes down to is data to make sure that we're, we're improving safety on the roadway. Yeah. Elizabeth, let's go to you next on that one. Sure, it's a really interesting question. Um, one of the my first experiences at the forum was working on um, selecting a city in the United States to test uh, an autonomous vehicle pilot. Uh, we ended up selecting um, the city of Boston and working with them uh, as part of a, a sort of mobility challenge where we hosted cities from across um, across the US and eventually selected one. Um, what I noticed throughout that experience and the forum, for those of you don't, who don't know it is, you know, it is an industry organization. We're an um, international organization focused on public, public private collaboration. But uh, eight years ago, we worked a lot more heavily with um, industries and sort of the private sector first and what I found with that AV project was, um, regardless of the cities we were looking at, we really had to have buy-in from government and buy-in from the city officials. And uh, you know, I think uh, one of I think for any mobility challenge or any mobility issue that um, needs to get implemented, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here because many of you have already done it in your careers, uh, having that perspective from the public sector um, was not just you know. Uh, invaluable and important, but it was critical to actually getting the project done and implemented. So in the case of Boston, we worked with the DOT and with the state DOT and with, um, you know, the mayor's office to establish which neighborhood we were going to be going into um, in addition to bringing those private sector partners in. And I don't think we would have been able to have the success of that pilot if we hadn't had the engagement uh, from government and sort of that connecting of the dots between public and private. So that's, that's I think, for me, been the, the biggest example over my, my time at the forum where I've seen um, an, an actor that's really needed to be a part of solving these, these problems. Wonderful. Jennifer, we talked a little bit on, about your cybersecurity background. I wonder how that plays into, into what's, you know, the, the critical aspects of informing policy. Hmm. Uh, well, first, I want to thank Elizabeth because you touched on all of the bullet points that I wanted to make sure were woven into this discussion. Public-private partnerships, I think oftentimes there's a little bit of an eye roll maybe. Yeah. We're like, oh, we're hearing this story again. Um, but it really is so important and so critical to the work, whether it's for transportation or um, critical infrastructure or cybersecurity. We have to get the voices to the table. And the one thing I've learned, especially when providing insight into cybersecurity policy is that we all speak slightly different language. Um, so whether you're in academia or government or nonprofit or private sector, um, we all come to the table with a different perspective and oftentimes it can be harmonized, a slightly different key, right? But, but we're all in sync with each other. It takes a little bit of effort to get there. 
Um, for cybersecurity policy making, I think we have not seen a great deal of it yet, certainly not enough of it. Um, but what we are talking about and what I am paying deep attention to are some of the state by state um, legislation activity that has been occurring. I know that in 2020, Massachusetts had um, a right to repair law that went out um, into the world. It was some really creative marketing and campaigning um, that went into the commercials for the voters. Um, and they made a decision that would later become contested and very controversial. Um, and the reason why it became controversial is because cybersecurity was not thought about and if it was thought about, it was buried. Um, and so one of the areas that we need to really be cognizant of as we're developing standards, best practices, hopefully policy and legislative activity around transportation mobility, no matter the form it takes, right? It's multimodal. We should be considering cybersecurity as part of that conversation. Um, and so to have nimble cybersecurity policy that's written in such a way that policy can easily adapt and change as technology adapts and changes um, will be critical to these discussions. So some of the conversations I've had, be it at the federal level, at the state level, um, a little bit, not as much as I would like on the international level, um, is as we're talking about things like ADAS systems or um, driver management systems or what have you, that we should also be writing at least some content towards the security of those platforms as well, because a vehicle is a system of system. It interacts and communicates with another system of systems. Um, and the more code and the more connectivity we have brings us great convenience. And we talk about the convenience and we all love that. Uh, but we also need to be doing it smartly and securely as well. Um, and so my um, advice and my input into the policy making is to always take an approach of test, test, test. We want to be able to test before we deploy technology. Um, I took somebody's thunder there. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, but we can't say it enough, honestly. Yeah. Um, but not just before we deploy it into the world, but also while the technology lives out in the world. So representing cybersecurity, I can tell you that the easier the technology is to access in the day-to-day -day life, the more people will play with it, either for malintent or just out of curiosity and accidents happen. And if there's one way to screw up technology, it's letting humans interact with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so those are the types of conversations we have on the policy side in relation to cybersecurity is how to test it and how to validate it and what type of exploitation is possible. That's, that's a really interesting point. I was participating in um, a seminar a couple of weeks ago and, you know, heavily focused on, on cybersecurity. And one of the points that came up during that discussion was if we fast forward, let's say 10 years and, you know, we have a lot of, you know, great mobility and play and connected vehicles, connected infrastructure, and we're all really benefiting from this, the inevitability when you have something in wide deployment like that is, you know, some people will keep up with their patches and their upgrades and, you know, keep things current and other people may not. And so, you know, from a policy perspective, it's going to be interesting to see how we relate to something like that. And, and so not to over take over all the time, um, but another component of this are aftermarket technologies that get integrated, yep. whether it's an insurance dongle, there's new, I think it's amazing, valet technology. I won't put a brand on it that you can <laughs> integrate into your vehicle and it will yeah. drop you off at your favorite venue, go park itself and come back, right? And pick yeah. you up via sensor technology and applications. Um, but we don't talk about who's liable if something goes wrong right. with those things. And, and so we probably have a noticeable absence of an attorney on this panel, <laughs> um, but they, they could talk forever. But those are concerns that we're looking at from a security perspective. Wonderful. Thank you. So, um, Joanne, let's shift gears a little bit into mm -hmm. um, human factors, because as we were, you know, talking in, in preparation for, for today's panel, we really dove into, um, you know, the role that human factors plays in terms of, you know, in, informing um, 
uh, first of all, the successful adoption of this technology, because I was sort of talking a little bit earlier about the low speed autonomous shuttle. And, and one of the learnings that we have is just the trust that people might have of being in a vehicle that doesn't necessarily have somebody piloting it and, and just how people interact with that um, as, as a huge factor to the commercialization and adoption of these technologies. I wonder if you could reflect for us a little bit more about that, that role that, that human factors plays in informing policy. Sure, I'd be happy to. I think it's it's really interesting because we can talk about uh, adoption at really high level issues, or we can talk about it in terms of someone actually sitting in the vehicle. And I, that's kind of the approach the human factors will have is what's going on sort of in the immediate interaction with the vehicle and the human. And uh, we come back to this repeatedly, and we'll probably repeat a couple more times, is we really need to consider that interaction between the human and the vehicle and what those, what people perceive as their needs and their requirements and but also their expectations of what they're going to get out of it what is this going to achieve for me and what i need so those are important it's also tricky and this is where i guess where the psychology kicks in is it's not always a case of what people really love that works the best it's uh, it has to be it has to be safe so not just kind of shiny and fancy and all the rest of that so we try and pick that apart and we have to do that with research and we have to do it with human research interacting with the system it's not always something that we can get at with a question for example so when we look at personal vehicles and right now we have uh, driver assistance systems on vehicles but we're seeing problems we haven't seen in, in vehicles before so for example we're now talking about things like mode confusion uh, where people lose track of who's in control at a particular time, or they don't understand, is the system going to do this? Or when is it going to do it? Or how is it going to do it? So those are the sorts of issues that we need to deal with. And all of those are important because if people don't trust the vehicles and understand them to do what they're going to, ultimately that affects acceptance and um, or it leads to problems. And so we want to address those things early on. So that can be at the level of personal vehicles, which I just mentioned, but you brought up shuttles and those are really interesting things to look at because those are huge differences than what's been around for years where you have a bus driver at the front of the bus and you can ask them anything pretty much like where's the best restaurant and all the rest of that. So some of those needs can be met by technology. Other needs, we need a responsible person to be able to intervene in issues of safety and security on board if there is no driver on board. Also, what if there's a vehicle um, a breakdown, all these other issues are a medical issue. So we need to have some way of doing that. And we're hearing more and more that a remote assistance may be a way of accomplishing that. And there are some really interesting human factors issues that we're looking at right now to really see how that can be safely deployed and be effective. So those are just some ideas and people want to know about those because they hear about them. And of course, always they hear about them and they hear about things that don't work. But we also need to really present them with things that do work so that they're making meaningful things and their trust is appropriately calibrated so that they trust what they should trust and not so much what they don't. Yeah. Right. It's interesting that that you mentioned that. I mean, um, especially about what people need and want and how they would actually interact with things. If I just sort of reflect on my own experience, I have um, a vehicle that um, is capable of parallel parking itself. Mm -hmm. I have never used it. OK, <laughs> I'm terrified to use it. I, I feel like, OK, well, you know, I mean, I learned to drive so many years ago. I actually learned how to parallel park. So I mean, I'm comfortable doing that myself. I wonder as we go forward, you know, with with younger folks that are going to come up with up through the ranks with these these capabilities inherent in the vehicles that they learn to drive in, are they going to forget or never learn how to how to parallel park? Mm -hmm. And just so that shifting dimension of, you know, in, in today's context, what people need and want and how that's going to evolve perhaps over over time as things become more available um, as well. But there are two other things that I really want to reflect on um, that, that has come up in everyone's conversation. One one part of that is um, the, the desire to to utilize data, like real data, real research, real learning to, to figure these things out, as opposed to, you know, taking maybe an approach of what you think might be, you know, the right way to do things or what you imagine might be the right way to do things. And Stacy, you mentioned that as well. I mean, you know, basing decisions on data is so, so important. And then the other piece, um, and, and, you know, Jen, you said you might have stole somebody's thunder, but I think every one of us can, can resonate with test, test, test. And when you think you've tested enough tests, 
tested again. And, and that's really one of the things that Area X.O brings to the table. I mean, that, that's one of our mantras is like, if we think we've tested enough, we, we have to go out and, and keep going because inevitably there's some nuance that we might have missed. And when something goes out into the real world, you know, the opportunity for tragic circumstances, if it's not well tested, is just far too great for anyone, you know, to to bear. Um, and, and so I, I we're, we're talking always about, you know, these days anyway, has has the pandemic had any effect on um you know, the, the changing paradigm of mobility, of how we see things being integrated. And honestly, I have no preconceived notion on this. I don't know the answer to it. And I'm not going to ask everyone to, to just, if anyone has a comment on that, I'd be really interested because we reflect on it in almost every aspect of our, our work life these days. You know, what effect has the pandemic had? Um, I, I'm just going to put it out there. Has it had an effect? I'll, I'll go. I, I think it definitely has had an effect. How direct or indirect um, those impacts are might be slightly nuanced, um, just in terms of shared mobility in the simplest form. During the pandemic, nobody wanted to share anything with anybody. <laughs> you know, um, so the, the human the human factor there is not a phrase I've used before. So thank you, ladies. Um, the human factor there was that we had to reconsider what shared mobility would look like. Um, in relation to um, a pandemic, viruses, um, how could we keep them sanitized, right? So very fundamental there. Um, on the other side of the coin, a lot of disruption on the supply chain side, um, a lot of disruption in production. Um, we've seen, and this is also an area in which I've been working lately as well with advanced manufacturing, in particular additive manufacturing, um, that went from a factory-based environment um, to something that was more distributed. And they were having smaller distributed areas for production where they could control who was working with who, because during the pandemic, they didn't want to bring thousands of people together under one roof, but they did feel comfortable and could control more easily um, pods of people, right? 25, 40, 50 people in one location that they could control who was in that bubble and who was working. So that was really fascinating for me to see on the production side, how the pandemic um, influenced that type of change. So I just can, I'd love to add just from the New yeah. York City perspective is probably the one, um, the one panelist who it doesn't own a car and um, spends my life sort of on the subways and taking city bike around uh, around New York City. Um, you know, I think the pandemic has had um, some really good things come out of it in the sense that more people are getting on bikes. Um, more people are realizing that the subway has actually been quite safe. Ridership has gone up. Uh, I think there was an initial, initial period where, you know, when things were shut down, when People just weren't traveling um, by transit, but now it, it's very heartening to see that come back. Uh, and you know, case rates do not go, have not gone up based on travel. People are wearing masks, uh, and I think you know, transit still remains in, in a city as dense as New York, sort of the safest and quickest way to get from point A to point B. Um, from the community level, if you flash back ten years ago, when you think about the technology of bike share. There were so many people even in my neighborhood who would not even think about getting on a bike to go to work. Now they're calling me to complain about how there aren't enough docks, you know, bikes for them in the morning when they go to work. So I think there have been uh, some improvements. I think as we look to the future, I think the pandemic has also exacerbated a lot of the uh, equity issues in a city like New York. Uh, the people who have the means during the pandemic, they bought cars because they wanted their own vehicle to go from point A to point B in New York City. Uh, they also took advantage of things like, you know, helicopters to take a helicopter shuttle from New York, from downtown Manhattan to an airport somewhere that's caused all sorts of congestion, noise pollution, air pollution, other things that have really been um, not so great. Um, but people, maybe because the economy is good and everything else um, now, at least for now, um, people have sought out these other forms of individual transit, which in a city like New York can be good, but it also has some challenges. So those are just some observations um, coming out of the pandemic that I think in particular big cities in a city like New York is certainly facing. Wonderful, 
My gosh, I mean, I could continue this conversation all afternoon. This has been so fascinating and insightful. And I thank all of you so much for participating and for sharing your thoughts and talking to us about sort of your, your journeys and how you got to, to where you are today and, and the things that you think are most important about informing policy and delivering strong policy to allow us to move mobility into, uh, into the real world. So um, all I can say is thank you so much. I hope that uh, you'll continue to join us for the rest of the afternoon. And I thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. What an incredible session. A special thank you to Stacy, Suzanne, Elizabeth, Joanne, and Jennifer for taking the time to join us today. We will now be taking a brief break until 2.40 p.m. and then we will launch our panel on fueling smart mobility, technology, and innovation. I'll see everyone back here in a few minutes. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you took the opportunity to have a little stretch and you are ready for our next session. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Kelly Days, Strategic Market Director at AreaX.O and moderator for our next session. Hi, Kelly. Over to you. Hi, Rebecca. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Rebecca. I'm really happy to be here today to moderate this next session. I've been really enjoying the conversation today um, and actually learning a lot. I've got pages of notes and, uh, and things I can only aspire to do uh, better in my career. So um, I wanted to, I guess, maybe just introduce the topic. So fueling smart mobility technology and innovation is a big topic. Um, something that we're very passionate about at AREX. My colleague Suzanne did such a great introduction of our test facility that I'll actually just skip over, over that uh, right now, although I will try to weave a little bit of our learnings throughout this conversation. We have such an incredibly expert group of technology leaders with us today, and I expect a very dynamic conversation, so I'll try really hard to monitor the questions and to also um, watch the time, but We'll lean on our, our operations group and Sam to keep me in line. I kind of wanted just to start maybe on um, the topic and some thoughts for me on the topic. Um, you know, I did a little bit of research before the session and one of the startling statistics that I know many of you are probably aware of, it's that by 2050, um, the National Department of Economic and Social Affairs expects that over two thirds of our population will actually live in an urban environment. Um, when you think about that from a, a city planning perspective, from a smart mobility perspective, that's actually quite staggering. Um, you know, cities are trying, we, we of course enjoy an amazing partnership with the city of Ottawa at Area Soto. And so we are really privy to a lot of the things that they think about when they're um, both looking at testing and deploying these smart mobility technologies, but also trying to manage, um, you know, carbon footprint commitments and budgets, right? So cities and municipalities don't have massive budgets and they're also very risk adverse. So um, a lot of the work we do at AREX.O is around a framework for test in private first and then deploy in a real world setting. And so again, um, that relationship along with City of Ottawa has really given some new insight to me on, um, on smart mobility. And the other thing, if you kind of ponder the COVID uh, pandemic has done, you know, changed so many things in our world. But when you kind of think around um, issues of order, overcrowding and public transportation, um, the importance of putting people and their well-being at the forefront of the innovation and the technology becomes ever so important. And, and again, around future urban planning. So um, it's kind of under this lens that I sort of took this topic and, and thought about what's the role of technology and smart mobility and how is it so critically important as we move to these new urban dense settings? Um, you know, I, I tried to look up, you know, what's the definitions of smart mobility? We use it so often in our, in our uh, work lives. And really it defines itself, I'm gonna read this, as the, the use of technology and innovation to manage multiple forms of transportation in more efficient and sustainable ways. So that was my redacted uh, definition and I guess under that lens and under that gamut, I'm really excited to have this discussion today um, with some of the most inspirational and expert leaders that I've come across in my entire career. Um, so I'm going to start first. Um, thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'd like to start first by inviting each of our panel members, if you could, uh, to maybe introduce yourselves a little bit about your organization and your role. And then also, um, and maybe our whole time will be used up on this, but also, you know, why did you choose to um, to take this career and this innovation role and career path? Um, like, how'd you get here today? And why did you pursue um, um, this work? So maybe I'll, I'll start first with, um, if I could, with Rima Shika. She's a founder and CEO of Begin.ai. Rima. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. This is uh, this is so exciting. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I guess uh, I can start with the last question first. Um, I am here because, you know, since I was uh, really young, I always wanted to build very impactful technologies. Like I really wanted to change the status quo. I really wanted to build awesome stuff for the future. 
Um, and the way for me impact is defined, it's inclusion, it's creation of you know, technologies that lower the barrier to education, to uh, mobility, to opportunity, to ev for everyone on the globe, like not, not only in my city, like everybody, right? And, um, and uh, by that function, I dropped out from a couple of universities and ended up building a couple of companies, uh, led some scale-ups to exit, and um, helped many companies in the mobility space build their you know, smart and um, autonomous technologies. And one of the issues that I found helping in the consumer space um, mainly is the privacy problem. Because, you know, if you want to build the future of mobility, you want to see like, you know, a consumer is going to expect that if they move into a car, if they just like get in a taxi, a flying taxi or whatever it is, they want that device to be completely personalized to them. So how do you personalize while maintaining, preserving privacy is the, is the question and the aspiration that we started from at beginning AI. And that's where we are. Great, thanks so much. Um, so now I would like to introduce Dimple Thomas. She's the engineering manager at Ericsson and the site that's located here in Ottawa. Hi, Dimple. Hi, sorry, it's always the the, the track to the mute button, but uh, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, I'm really honored again and humbled to be in this panel uh, with such inspirational leaders here. Uh, I'm also going to do the last first. Um, so what actually got me into Invest All and the partnership that we had with Smart Mobility was uh, the fact that um, I don't drive. So um, having access to uh, a way to get from point A to point B, uh, not being a driver, uh, was super exciting for me. And it meant freedom, really. Uh, and and uh, that combined with my passion for just innovation in tech and, and the projects that we have uh, in this domain was uh, the main reason why I got into the partnership with Invest Ottawa and Area XO. So, uh, and uh, yeah, so myself, uh, my name is Dimple Thomas. I started uh, off with Ericsson and I'm currently in Ericsson right now. Uh, I'm working as an engineering manager in the Cloud RAN department uh, in looking a little bit at systems DevOps uh, when it comes to delivering uh, RAN technology on top of cloud native architecture with uh, leveraging the full open source power of cloud. Um, and uh, I am also the theme driver of diversity and inclusion here at the Ericsson Ottawa site. Uh, and um, specifically with uh, the partnership with uh, Inve Invest Ottawa and Area XO, I was working quite uh, a lot within the team that was involved in network planning um, and delivering telecommunications back end to the solution. Thanks, Simple. And I didn't mention I actually have had the great privilege of working with uh, most of the people on this panel. So, um, so again, welcome. Um, I'd now like to go to uh, Rekha Sharma. She's the founder and CEO of Cell4X. And Rekha, over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. As everyone said, it's, you know, uh, delighted to be here, uh, you know, with all of you, get to learn from you. Uh, and thank you, Kelly, for the invitation. A uh, little bit about myself. I'm an electrical engineer by, uh, you know, by training, and I've learned a lot of computer science on job. Uh, last 10, 14 years, I've, I was always creating some kind of like, you know, software or some innovative technology in the field of electricity. And this is the time where the automotive uh, industry and the electrical industry is kind of, you know, linking together. And that's how I got interested. I did my bit of research where I saw that in last two decades, electrical industry has changed a lot. We have renewable power, wind and solar on the supply side and on the load side, EVs is like 20 to 21% year on year, you know, adoption rate. So what is cars with batteries? They are nothing but electrical load and more so they are movable. So they're going all over. So it's an interesting problem to solve. So I did some research and I feel that's, that's what got me excited that it's a, uh, problem to solve, like the problem that I'm trying to solve in SolveFlex is uh, uh, how are we going to charge all this? If we plug all the cars together, like imagine the electrical load, which will come on the grid and will we like be able to handle it? Probably not. 
maybe now, uh, but not in five years for sure. So uh, there is a need of a smart solution where we can not only manage the charging, but also leverage all this battery we just sitting in our garage or in, you know, in our office uh, where we are sitting here right now having a meeting. So why not just use it optimally uh, as just a battery resource? So that's the, you know, that's the research and the development that we are up to. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in, in nutshell, I think I'm also excited how the cars can drive themselves. And like, uh, so my dream is that I send a signal and car can drive itself to the place I want them to charge and come back and, uh, you know, park while I'm like right now talking. So let's see how the industry will move in the next 10 years. But there is some work to be done for that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. Um... Yes, indeed. Again, in, in a lot of work we've been doing, um, looking at electrification and uh, I don't know, your five years, maybe even less, Sereka, with this gas prices. So <laughs> this issue um, is, you know, how does how do how do cities manage the uh, load and charging load in residents, even a small increase of 10 to 20 percent in um, in vehicles, um, in purchased vehicles. And I, I, I would say that will probably go faster if they could just get some inventory. But Anyway, interesting, interesting topics for sure. Um, I'm now really excited to um, to introduce Yu Zhang. Uh, he's the product manager um, at BlackBerry and a number of their security solutions that we've been um, using at Ariax.io. And of course, of course, BlackBerry QNX is one of the uh, founding partners along with Ericsson, who's also on this panel of Ariax.io. So Yi, um, over to you. Well, Kelly, thank you, uh, thank you for that intro. I, I, I don't have to tell people who I am. Unlike the uh, three inspirational leader who just spoke, um, when I first started in high tech, I really had no idea I was going to end up in smart mobility. But I think with uh, IoT permeating everybody's life, um, it's just a matter of time that we'll all run into smart mobility. Uh, my encounter with smart mobility actually came naturally because I was part of uh, BlackBerry QNX. For those of you who doesn't know uh, or haven't heard the name QNX, it is foundational software that's being deployed in more than 200 million vehicles worldwide. So by association being in that industry, um, software is becoming the new value add that OEMs are using to differentiate themselves. It used to be, you know, you have a cool car, it looks nice, you know, there's this compartment that's new. Now it's software. So because we provide the foundational software for cars, smart mobility is something that has been put on our agenda, um, whether we like it or not. But be, having worked with uh, Invest Ottawa and Area XO, it's just so exciting to see how wide that scope is and how big the industry can be and how many different moving pieces come together to make an exciting future. So I didn't um, set out to land in this field, but I think this is a field that nobody um, can afford to not touch in, in the future. So excited to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Yi. Um, and now, and certainly last but not least, I'm just going around the, the order of the screen. Um, so really excited to welcome Sarah Thornton from California. Welcome, Sarah. She's um, an autonomy systems engineer with a company called Neuro. And excited to have your perspective. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks for the intro, Kelly. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Thornton. Uh, I'm a senior systems engineer at Neuro. So I focus on safety validation of our autonomous software. So how do we gain confidence in the safety and performance of our system before we deploy uh, in communities that we care about? So uh, kind of what led me to here, I think that means I'm very well in, in, entrenched in the smart mobility space uh, because of that. Uh, what kind of led me here is actually since a, a little girl, I really loved cars and I really liked robots. Those were not things that worked together at the time, um, but that what drove me into engineering um, as, a, as a young person. And um, through my academic career, I, I was drawn to controls and automation. Um, and through that, uh, I was then exposed to a project where I um, was tasked with designing an autonomous vehicle to behave ethically. And so um, I was now moving away from these, what I was used to very quantitative requirements to these very qualitative fuzzy requirements. And how do we bridge uh, these qualitative objectives of balancing 
you know, we as human drivers are really good at balancing safety, mobility, and legality. How do we translate that into a quantitative algorithm? And what does that look like? What processes can support that? Um, and so through that, I found that it was more than just the responsibility of an individual module, like the control system uh, or the motion planner, to ensure that the system was safe. The whole thing has to come together to be safe. And so I've really enjoyed um, working as a systems engineer at Neuro to really ensure that the product we put on road um, behaves safely and ethically. Thanks, Sarah. That was great um, and, and super interesting. And so I'm looking at my questions here, and, and many of them we've, we've already started to address. So maybe I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, so a reoccurring theme that we kind of saw when we were doing a bit of our, um, our, our staging for this event and a bit of our information sharing, it was really around a safety and security. So that is kind of our absolute North Star at Ariax. So the whole reason for being everything we do is around safety. Um, and you could take safety and security in a number of ways and cybersecurity for a lot of you is, is a key component. So I wanted to say, um, I know you're all very passionate about starting you know, from a safe and secure standpoint. Um, I kind of wanted to say maybe as you're developing and driving the imp implementations of some of these new technologies within your leadership roles or, or your roles with your companies, um, how are you really kind of like, how are you seeing the role of safety security change? Is it becoming more prominent? Um, you know, how, how are you kind of seeing it in your everyday lives and technology? Where, where would you say um, it, it lies in your development cycle or in your leadership cycle? How's safety and security, you know, influencing the work that you do? I'll leave it open if anyone wants to jump in and try it. Otherwise I can pick on somebody. <laughs> I know ye, this is right up your wheel. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will go, I will go. Um, yeah, actually, I feel very passionate about that subject. And Sarah, you and I probably will have uh, parallel lives once I start to talk. Um, at uh, BlackBerry QNX, I manage our portfolio for safety and security products. And what we have witnessed in the past five years in the auto industry is really extremely interesting. So five years ago, um, that's uh, probably around the time that the first safety standard for automotive um, came into being, that was not really on the agenda for the automakers. Because if you think of the older car, uh, you have your what we call passive safety. So there's the seat belt, there's also airbag. Um, when you have software running in a car, uh, you know, that's hundreds of times larger than the software you'll find in a 747 jet, the chances of something going wrong um, is actually pretty high. So that's why the automakers, we've seen them very actively and quickly putting safety on their agenda. And they are demanding software that comes with a safety qualification. So Sarah, the work you do, we absolutely do it here at QNX. Um, for ADAS systems, especially higher level ADAS systems, the OEMs are anticipating something uh, at the level of ACOD, which is the highest level um, of stringency for safety. So now that the OEM has already finished that movement, like all the safety systems in the car has comes with a pretty high standard today, now the attention is being turned to security. So I'm seeing the exact same trend um, unfolding for security as it has for safety. And of course, it comes all the way from the lowest point of, in the stack hardware, right, SOC, to through the software stack all the way to application and even UI, how you anticipate a user to use it. And also uh, Rima and you know, leaders like you are thinking of how to use AI to make cars more safe and more secure. Um, AI is being used in IDPS systems for a more secure car. So I'm seeing that trend unfolding. And the one interesting thing I'm, I'm thinking, Kelly, is that whether the industry or the market will have the same luxury and time to respond to security as they had for safety, which took more than five years. Um, all it takes is a few defining events, high visibility defining events to actually place things in motion. And I'm seeing that happening right now. So it's a really interesting space to watch. And 
we are getting the requirements firsthand from OEMs and tier ones. And I know that there's not enough talents today in the industry to cover all that. So that's definitely going to be a very interesting thing to watch in the next, I'd say three to five years or even shorter. Yeah, Yi, and, and um, we're so lucky to have the BlackBerry team as one of our, our partners at Area Exodo. The other area, um, so we've done some training with them, trying to fill the talent gap, trying to help, um, you know, designers, software designers with security um, in mind from day one, um, talking about certi certifications. But the other area, Yi, that we're really lucky to work with you on is as companies like Software X and others come online, the role of communication and connecting the infrastructure to the vehicles is really going to just like for folks like you who think about security all the time. I mean, that must just be like, whoa, um, <laughs> you know, vulnerabilities. Um, but really, that's where we're going to see smart mobility and um, in a lot of the, um, you know, streamlined effects of not having to own a car and one lane. Um, is when everything's talking to everything and we play, um, that's really one area of focus for us and we're thrilled to work with the BlackBerry Certicom team on their SCMS solution and looking at secure transmission of, of you know, uh, information and broadcast of safety information. So thanks to you for kicking us off and, um, and we're excited to have you uh, and the work we do with you. So maybe over to some others, um, you know, how are you kind of thinking about safety and security and in the work you do and how have you seen it change a little bit over the years? Yeah, I'm happy to take a take a stab at this. Um, so uh, I, I feel like I've, I've worked on, uh, as I mentioned, I guess like working on taking kind of a controls approach to ethical considerations. Um, I had some exposure to some, some techniques uh, or processes that can help us um, Shape, shape our technology design away from maybe just um, uh, like you're mentioning here, uh, you know, away from maybe just pure efficiency, but also bringing it into consider safety, security, or other other components, other human values that we care about as well. Uh, one technique that I found really useful was called um, it is called value sensitive design, where you explicitly try to figure out what are the human values you want to capture in this design. And then use that as your goalpost uh, for iterating in your design process. As and you come up with uh, ways to translate these high-level human values into something quantitative. And you are going to make approximations, and we have to be, I think, explicit and monitor that. Um, you know, as we improve technologies to measure things that are more explicitly aligned with human values, uh, that will improve. But right now, I think we have a lot of work to do there. And then translating that back to metrics that we understand. Um, as uh, also proxies for these human values. And so using those as our measuring points and metrics for success, um, as opposed to just like pure profit maximization where we often tend to see in business circles and discussions about new technologies. Um, so I, I'm a huge advocate for techniques like that, um, that allow us to broaden our objective function um, at, a high, at the high level and trickle that down into the components. And so um, that's also a very systems engineering approach to things as well. So we, in systems engineering, we kind of model things as this V, uh, this V shape. And so uh, at the top of the V is a really high system level um, requirements and, and validation that we want to do. And as you go down the V that goes into more um, details of like particular subsystems, components and modules. Um, and so I, I would say it's, it, as you know, just my experience, it is more than just uh, an individual component to ensure the system is safe. It happens at all of these layers. It happens in how we define our requirements, it happens in how we're testing, it happens in how we're implementing it. Um, and so it's really on everyone's uh, I think plates to really ensure that we're designing systems that are safe uh, and secure and, and, and capture these human values we want. Oh, uh, Rima, I saw you, cut, you came off, um, off mute. Yeah. Yep. I'm really uh, inspired by, by what Yi and Sarah were saying. So we took a very practical approach to, uh, you know, privacy and security, actually. So we zoomed in on data um, centralization problem, because uh, as soon as you take data out of the vehicle or any consumer device and, you know, send it to a cloud, central servers, wait for it to make decisions, um, then you're hitting latency problems. Like imagine you have to, you know, if you're millisecond late in a decision then you relate in a decision <laughs> right and then you have the other problems which is actually you know the cybersecurity threats of uh, centralizing data sets like uh, 
you know, you have breaches all the time. It's not unheard of that you have a breach. Um, so the way we looked at this is like, how do I make it profitable, actually? You know, how do I make it, you know, cost effective to build decentralized systems, to build systems that are secure from the ground up? Um, so that's kind of like the way we started the, the work and we, you know, by aligning the interest of all the stakeholders, by the product manager, the, you know, the salesperson, all these people, everybody wants it to be profitable because actually for what I noticed from my experience in this industry is, um, you know, the manufacturers or, or, uh, you know, different, different players in the supply chain, they have a problem that every smart feature grows exponentially in cost the more people use it. But you actually don't have, you know, that exponential growth in profit or revenue. So you hit the, like you hit that ceiling of like, how do I justify the cost of building these features? So um, so then we like we 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 opened uh, we opened the books of like you know the old the old tricks in the book in security and encryption and the new tricks of like new system designs that are like ethical system designs and and we said like all of this can be for the benefit of the organizations and the benefit for the markets and so we we focused 100% on decentralized machine learning and we said you know make uh you know create decisions in the car uh, create like the machine learning models in the car, let them work there, let the merging of the relationships happen asynchronously. And, um, and we never heard the conflict since we started that process. So, so that's been our approach. I just want to add from the network side, uh, we talked a little bit about low latency. So with 5G, you know, we unlock really the capability to have ultra low latency. And those are use cases that are defined uh, within 5G. Um, and when it comes to security piece, of course, we continue to work at hardening our interfaces and our products, et cetera. But uh, from the latency side, certainly um, being able to have ultra low latency is an enabler for V2V communication, V2X communication. So that's the network angle um, to enabling it. Thanks, Jim, Paul. Um, and, you know, oh, sorry, uh, Rekha, did you want to comment? I'll probably just comment one like quick thing, just one use case of what Reva said and what Dimple said. Uh, uh, like while I am taking the decisions when a card should charge and when it should not charge, it's really important that we should not share that information if there is no data breach. Just an example of you know like my time before in the industry, uh, the grid operators they don't even want to go to cloud because of that that reason because there are so many data breaches and there are so many hackers they're trying to get the grid down because the minute you don't have the electricity in the grid that's where they can do the crimes and then the whole business will go down so any car which will come in the grid will have to follow all the rules that any power generator or load follows so it's i think rima what you're making in ye like that's something i i have this the layer that my software has to have to make it more like secure. Uh, so yeah, I think it's inevitable, like it's given, like we don't even, like we don't even have choice uh, to use it or not. Yeah, and, and to really find the benefits as I was trying to articulate, not as, as wonderfully as all of you, um, but to enjoy what, you know, real smart mobility will be by 2050, this all has to work. And so in a lot of ways, um, you know, these discussions in this group of people are setting the stage to, to really be able to enjoy what smart mobility will really bring. And if we kind of think back to, I was just, while you guys were talking, I was thinking back to the, the topic that we're discussing. And, and I, it, for me, the word innovation, right? Innovation and smart mobility. Um, some of the topics that you guys are talking about were, if you had have asked me even a week ago, they may not have been so top of mind, right? So, so it's those, some things like, um, Safety and security, for sure. Um, and you, you're very articulate how you differentiate those. But the ethical considerations, Sarah, that you're really, you know, proposing from the forefront, you know, sustainability and privacy, quality of life. Um, these themes keep coming up over and over with this group. And, you know, if we kind of think we're, we're all here as International Women's Week, I know first and foremost, you're all amazing founders, leaders, and engineers. But, um, you know, under the topic of Women's Week, I think, I think there are some differences on how we may approach things. 
Um, maybe that may or may not be true. But again, for me, as I listen to you all, I'm just hearing reoccurring themes that um, that are so important to really making this work in the future. And so maybe I, I'll, I'll go back on one more question and I'm just watching time. But when we talked earlier, um, all of you emphasized um, unique design and development properties and practices that you think about and deploy when you're creating these te technologies and different considerations that you do when you're starting to look at new smart mobility products um, that really benefit benefit all of the users and, and enhance quality of life. So maybe I would just ask you to maybe, um, you know, give some examples or, or how, how do you think about this as you start to, to code or start the development cycle of some of your products? Maybe so I can, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, what, what does innovation mean for you, Sarah, as you start to, to define these new products and technologies around smart mobility? Because I sure have heard a lot of different themes um, from all of you on how you start to create these things. And, and I think you said as well, you know, often, you know, finding the right founders and funders and, and people to support something that may not, you know, cash may not be the forefront of, of the work. There may be cheaper ways to do it, but it doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. So just wanted to get some conversation going on that and, and how you found that to be, um, to be working for you um, today. Uh, yeah, I guess like how kind of I came about the, my, my approach to the ethical um, considerations uh, was I, well, I originally turned to philosophers and tried to figure out how do they model what is good and bad behavior? And how does that translate into mathematical frameworks that we use in, in codifying um, algorithms? Uh, that was helpful and informative in terms of uh, showing certain different types of mathematical implementations um, tend to support different uh, philosophical normative frameworks. So um, a rule-based implementation, so something based on conditional statements, um, or switches that would be uh, that would fall under a deontological framework. So it's a very rule-based um, philosophical framework. And then if you were to do uh, something more optimization-based, that would fall in line with a consequentialist or utilitarian philosophical uh, approach. Um, that was uh, again helpful to el elucidate th those, and you can draw different conclusions based on your um, based on which, which philosophical framework maybe you're, you're most often toting in, in your implementation, but it wasn't ensuring that at the end of the day, the whole system was actually being ethical, like actually behaving the way that is socially aligned, if I may. And so that's when I uh, learned about value sensitive design and where I found that to be really different from other design techniques that I've encountered where the design is focused a lot. And this is a good, you know, this is, I'm not saying any approach is necessarily good or bad, um, but in those design techniques like human-centered design or even uh, universal design, they're very focused on the usability aspect of it. And, and that's an important consideration. Uh, what I found in the value-sensitive design literature was you wanted to not only consider the direct end user, but also the indirect users, the people who are implicated, who can be implicated by the technology beyond just directly using it. And I think that's really even more important now today with the scale that we're seeing technologies being deployed, and especially with smart mobility solutions. They're everyone is a stakeholder in these mobility solutions. It's, it's almost uh, impossible not to be impacted by this as uh, Risha was describing earlier in her keynote talk. Um, and so uh, how can we account, how, well, one, can we start identifying who those indirect stakeholders are? Can we identify who those stakeholders are? What are their human values in this design task, this thing that we're trying to accomplish? And then how do we start you know, mapping, uh, dealing with those tensions um, and documenting how we want to resolve resolve them and just have open communication more around these human values and how we want to capture that in our technology design. Thanks, Sarah. And I know that Dimple um, was also wanting to make a comment. So over to you, Dimple. Uh, no, I think uh, Sarah very eloquently put it. I feel like, um, you know, it comes down to product development and diversity, ensuring diversity within people that develop the product um, makes for technology that works for everyone, right? So. That's uh, just what I wanted to sort of add to that comment. Yeah, and I know, um, and, and maybe if no, if everyone else is still on mute, I'll just uh, sing out you a little bit on this. I know that at BlackBerry QNX, you sit on a lot of international bodies that are literally subscribing some of the ethics into the, the algorithms of the vehicles and other things. And just thought maybe you might have a comment on this one as well, Yi. 
Um, so my comment might not be so um, thrilling as uh, what Sarah and Dimple had mentioned. Uh, I will say though, uh, when I think about smart mobility and the most exciting thing was one of the marketing videos BlackBerry had created. I think you can still find it on YouTube. It uh, starts with this guy driving the car. So for BlackBerry and QNX, uh, smart mobility very is very focused on cars. We think of it as, as moving endpoints, right? It's like an extension of you. Um, this guy gets in the car and how he interacts with the world and the car becomes um, his point of uh, reaching out to the world. It recognizes what store it's passing. It, it knows when to ask the guy whether you want to schedule an appointment because the car knows he goes there. So there's your data privacy and, and all that. So that vision is a very, very sexy vision. And I think some of the leaders on this panel today are actually working on those sexy technology. What smart mo mobility means for me when I go to work every day, what I take pride in is that we can give you the layer of foundational software, you can build all these sexy stuff on and expect it not to crash and expect it to be safe and secure. So that what makes that what makes my day when I uh, think about smart mobility is not as sexy as some of the apps that's running on it, but without those apps, you don't actually have a story. So Kelly, I just wanna say, I so appreciate being invited to invest Ottawa and also connect to all these companies that build build out the cool parts without which smart mobility is just uh, pretty boring. So that's that's what I want to say about uh, smart mobility. Thank you. And we're getting we're starting to get the hook. Um, so we need to start to wrap up here. So maybe um, just as uh, one one last consideration, maybe I would say um, what truly excites you about the smart mobility future? So we had talked about, I know most of you probably don't think more than five years out, maybe even less. Um, but, you know, when you think of, of the smart mobility future, the work you do, things you're seeing, what, what kind of really excites you about that? And then also, I know, um, also I wanted to mention on here is is training and talent and in, encouraging more more people to go to, into STEM programs, my, more diversity in STEM programs, I know is near and dear to all of your hearts. So please, if you want to start to insert that into your final comments, I, I welcome it. Maybe we could just start with Rima and we can go around. Okay. Um, you know, the work we're doing with ODXO, the uh, the network we get through Invest Ottawa is amazing. It's really helpful. Um, this panel is a great example. I, I was really enjoying just listening to how Sarah designs her system, how he is very, you know, is our re reliability cornerstone. It's like, you know, with, without without reliability, we can't we can't build creative systems. And that's true. So um, I, you know, as a as a person who's always followed my passion, I look at uh, everyone in STEM and I say, you know, just build where where your heart is because i don't think there's any there's going to be any limitation to the to how many things can be built in any step of the supply process there's so much to be developed and there are so many problems unsolved and just like sarah was saying like you know the the ethical frameworks is is a very fascinating subject by itself because if you want to build an ethical machine, you got to go back and you're like, you look at the entire history of humankind and figure out like, how did we, how did we figure out our ethical systems in the first place? So like, there's so much to be designed. There's so much to be inspired by. So, so yeah, I definitely encourage every woman, every person at the beginning, I were 50% women, 50% queer. So like, you know, come in, do good stuff. And yeah, this is my, this is my feeling about the future of mobility just build yeah right and, and dimple yeah just adding to rima's point about build where your heart belongs right so about passion and and really <clears throat> one area that i've been super passionate about is increasing diversity in our talent pipeline all the way from high schools to industry so uh, i know that the, there were a couple of questions about how to pursue a career in smart mobility uh, for people that are looking to just start in the area uh, so if you're in high school certainly check in with your high school co-op programs especially if you're in the ottawa area 
A lot of high schools have high school co-op programs, and that's a fantastic way to get your first bite into the industry. Um, and it counts for a lot, as Ericsson actively has high school co-op programs and, and pursues uh, to, to have your talents in, in our workspace. Work with your university, um, especially in innovation ecosystems or pods, such as uh, the opportunities that are afforded by Area XO, where we work actively between industry, research, academia, and SMEs. Um, so you get a lot of exposure to explore your ideas in these innovation test beds. Um, and then don't, se don't self-select out. So please apply because, again, we are actively looking to hire diverse talent. So please apply and increase uh, your chances of getting into this industry. So that would be my my advice. The market is alive and kicking here in Ottawa. So uh, please do, yeah, apply. <laughs> Thanks, Dippo. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and Reka? Yeah, I think uh, like, you know, other than the cool stuff and the tech junkie that I am, I want to always create more software. There is a motivation. And there is an inspiration for me to create what I'm creating that our mantra is charge your EV when it's green. So we did our first thing, first step, like all the EV owners that we created electric vehicle cars. There is sustainable. We don't use, you know, like you know, any carbon emission, like why we are doing, uh, why we're using the car, but there is a tailgate emission that if you charge your vehicle, from the energy which is coming from non-renewable resources, you beat the purpose. So that if I if I'm able to successfully do what I'm trying to do, there is this satisfaction, uh, like ethical satisfaction, which is uh, underlying. So that's the motivation towards this project. But of course, you know all that fancy stuff of AI and software, you know it's it's there. Uh, one thing which I want to say is uh, like when I was uh, you know, young, I did listen to uh, like Sharon Sandberg and all, and it actually affected me. So what I'm doing, my part is uh, like any local school, high school, they always have these science competitions. And then, you know, like people are like us, we can go as a judge. So I am actually a like registered judge for Bay Area, like because I was living there, Bay Area science competition where I go judge. So if other young girls of eighth, ninth, 10th grade will see a judge who's coming as a lady, it's it's inspirational. So those are the things that I do in the school level. Like of course, if they have already enrolled in, you know, college, hiding and other things come, you know, come along. But if we can inspire from when they're really young, uh, that that's the thing I want to, uh, like you know, I want to contribute as a, you know, as a woman leader in the technology. I'll probably pass it on to Kelly back. Yeah, thanks, Erica. And you just some some last comments. Sure. Uh, two thoughts. Um, one is that uh, my what excites me about smart mobility is whether we can use this technology to make the world a better place. I know with COVID, everybody working from home, um, some of the environments start to recover. And I think smart mobility is a man-made technology that can do that. So I, I that excites me a lot. My second thought is actually as a woman in smart mobility as and also as somebody who benefited from multiple initiatives within BlackBerry to cultivate women, I would say that we have an advantage in this market as we have a more connected and big picture view. We have patience and we also have the ability to bring a lot of things together. So I really would encourage all the ladies that attended today's event to, like the other ladies say, follow your passion. And chances are you're going to land in smart mobility anyway, because nobody can escape that. Thanks, C. And Sarah, your your last comments, they're pulling the hook on us here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be, be really quick. I, I think we have a really exciting opportunity with any new technology to uh, use it for what, you know, to be intentional with how we design it. And I, I think there's... Um, I think there's, that's what excites me about smart mobility is I've seen a lot more conversations around how do we use this now intentionally uh, to address systemic issues. So uh, I'm personally really excited about that. And I, I also help encourage, uh, you know, women and, and volunteer for, for groups too and, and stuff. So um, it's, I found that to be also personally rewarding, but also I think beneficial for, for uh, younger and other people interested in moving to this space. Great. Thanks everyone so much for your amazing insights today for participating and um, 
and hopefully uh, this will help encourage more women and more students and more diversity into STEM and um, and your insights will help influence some, some product development. So thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly, Rima, Reka, Dimple, Sarah, and Yi for that very informative discussion. We are now going to take a very short break. Um, we, everyone can come back for 329 and we will be returning with our fireside chat on the involving evolving investment landscape and global market. This session is one not to be missed. We'll see everyone back here in four minutes. Thank you. Winterland, tell me all your secrets. Fill me in on your wildest moments. Color trees, your yellow leaves. everyone and we are getting ready now to launch our next session and I am very delighted to welcome back to the stage Mandela Salvaraja, CBC national columnist and tech journalist to moderate our investors fireside chat. Welcome back Mandela. Hi um, I'm just learning to unmute it's only been two years that we've been doing this and I'm still have my uh my microphone muted. Uh, it's a delight to be here and it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest. Our next guest is Yvonne Lush, Dr. Yvonne Lush, who's the investment principal at Robert Bush 
uh, Bosch Venture Capital. Hi, Yvonne. Hey, Manjula. I see that you've got you've got some spring colors going. It's actually my birthday today, so I got some flowers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday. So, yeah. so what what are you doing that's special on your birthday? Um, working <laughs> but um yeah my, my colleagues gave me a very very nice you know small birthday celebration with a cake and some flowers so i'm good to go well i'm i'm really delighted to, to have you here and uh, and get a chance to speak to you because i think you know we've we've heard a, a ton of different voices uh, on smart mobility and the idea of getting of women seeking investment and how they can do that better and getting more women to be investors is obviously a topic of, of interest to us. So let me start you off here. You have such a fascinating career. I mean, you've gone through multiple countries uh, on your journey. Uh, talk to me about that, your journey in automotive tech from your early days in Germany to now. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to do that. So actually, I joined um, the Bosch Corporation almost 20 years ago. So two decades, that's that's a long time. Um, but of course, there's also a lot of, you know, good times and many experiences I made. Um, and I started in actually one of Bosch's um, semiconductor fabs um, as a quality engineer in the automotive space. Um, and this was very, very interesting since um, people think many people think quality management is very boring, but actually uh, in this particular case, it was very, very exciting because this was at the intersection between customers, suppliers, production, engineering, logistics, and all of it. So, you know, in my, in my second week, um, I drove to BMW, um, I don't know, somewhere in the Munich area, and we had to explain them a quality problem we caused which is not always like very pleasant, but it's necessary to, you know, to explain them and to gain back confidence in this in this space, as Bosch being, you know, one of the biggest tier one suppliers in the automotive industry. Um, I did that for a couple of years and I switched roles, I went into engineering. I wanted to see this other side. Um, and then I went back to quality management for one of Bosch subsidiaries. Not in, cons not in automotive electronics, but in consumer electronics, which was also very, very exciting to see. So then my customers were not the BMWs and the Audis of the world, but the Samsungs and the Apples of the world um, mm. in the consumer industry. Very interesting to have this different insights on, you know, what's their um, requirements and, and priorities. And after that, I got the chance to move to US with Bosch. So this was all back in Germany where I grew up. And Bosch is an um, international corporation, but the headquarters still in Germany. So I came here and I started an innovation hub for automotive electronics. So that's one of the Bosch bigger divisions, you know, taking care of all the electronic stuff, what's going on in the modern car. And that's actually a lot. I mean, people know that nowadays and in the near future, a car is dominated by its electronics and it's not dominated by, by the chassis and by the frame or, you know, the metal it's it's dominated by technology um so therefore we thought it's we, we have to be here in silicon valley we have to dig into the startup ecosystem what's going on here um how can we how can we leverage these startup activities and this this innovation you feel here almost on the street um how to leverage this to the bosch corporation to foster innovation this is what i started six years ago um, and then after a little while, I joined the venture group because mm. um, I realized that working with startups um, and diving into this ecosystem of startups and the whole support system around is so fascinating. And I wanted to become yeah. an investor. Well, it's interesting because I've, I've heard you talk about your excitement when you first came across that ecosystem of of startups and 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 venture capital what like what attracted you to that world of investment i mean growing up kind of growing up in the automotive industry but also in a large corporation um of course it's 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 the other opposite of of how you know how fast innovation can be mm. startups are so fast they're so flexible they're small they can pivot if they if they see that you know things are not going well in this particular area or solving this particular problem, 
and they have a cool technology, they can they can find another area to 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 jump into and to solve a a really important problem with their technology. So um, this was so cool just to see this this energy. I mean, yes. it was all about the energy and you know whether it was old not old, like experienced guys or, or women doing this or very young kids like from grad school. It's so more diverse in all different aspects um, that this was very, very refreshing and very cool to see and to be into it. That's really fascinating. I, I find the same energy as a as a journalist uh, coming across uh, startup founders and, and you know, it's, it's really uh, infectious actually, that kind of energy. Give me a sense of what you do as a principal at uh, Robert Bosch Venture Capital. Yeah, so Robert Bosch Venture Capital, we are a small but mighty global team of around about 20 something investors worldwide. We are four in Silicon Valley and then we have a team in Germany and Israel and China. Mm. Um, and we all as investment principal, we are all responsible for you know, bringing, bringing new deals, um, conducting the whole deal, the due diligence and everything um, until the investment. And um, you should think about Robert Bosch Venture Capital rather like an institutional VC. That means mm. we um, want to see a strategic fit to the corporation, but we are eventually financially incentivized. That means we look at startups to the same glasses like an institutional VC. We want the startup to grow and to you know to grow exponentially and to make everyone successful um, and it's less about you know that they work that they have to work with Bosch with a corporation this is nice but it's not a must oh that's um, interesting okay it's not yeah. a must at all um, because we want to expand Bosch's horizon therefore we don't necessarily want to interfere with the core business but rather expand the horizon for example investing into quantum computing um and so since we are like rather financially incentivized we act like a financial vc we are raising funds we just opened fund number five which is a 300 million us dollar fund and all five funds together is around about 1 billion under management um we do invest from series seed where it's probably a 500k check up to a series c where it can be a 8 to 10 million check uh, we keep reserves for follow-on investments. Um, we do leads. We love to co-lead with other reputable VCs, um, but we also do follow. We do all of it in all geographies um, I mentioned. So it's interesting because you are you're kind of this independent arm. It's not yeah. you know it's not simply a place where there is a strategizing for acquisitions or something like this. You're looking at this independently like an independent um, vc firm give me a sense of your investment thesis what, what are the kind of companies and ideas that you invest in um i mean it it as i said you know since we want to see a strategic fit um it still has to somehow fit to bosch um but this is very very broad i like to say this is everything from autonomous driving to smart dishwashers Oh, um, wow. because you know hmm. that's all in our in our space um and i mean the, the the topics which are hot of course it's about autonomy it's automation in indus industrial in production it's enterprise SaaS, um it's um you know newer topic you know the hydrogen economy um reducing your carbon footprint um it's all different kind of new compute um, ideas from AI chips to quantum computing and silicon photonics. I mean, it's it's all over the place. It's a lot. We so there's no one strict investment um, um, theme. It's very very broad. So you know, give me a sense. I, I'm sure that there's, uh, maybe we'll just narrow it down to one or two. What are some, some of the, uh, one or two of the biggest investments and uh, success stories that, that, that Bosch has made? Yeah, um, I think investments, they're all more or less, you know, as I mentioned, everything is between, you know, a couple of million and maybe in total, like over the lifetime of a company, maybe 20, 20 million in total, not more. Um, one of the more well-known companies is, is one of the AI chip companies for data centers in, in UK called Graphcore. 
Mm. They are almost a $3 billion valuation company. Uh, this is one of the more successful ones, um, at least on paper, because it's still private. Um, we invested in a quantum computing hardware company called IonQ, and they went public via a spec merger um, last year in October, which was also very successful for us. Um, and then there was a company also in UK actually called Wave Optics. They do waveguides for augmented reality glasses, and we sold the company to um, Snap. Mm. for 500 million so that's that's public information last year um, I would call that a success yes so yeah. you see right even from yeah. these three examples is very very broad it's interesting you mentioned um uh, quantum computing by the way just for some reason I know this about you I think you have either a, there's a personal interest in quantum computing isn't that right I'm, I mean, kind of. I'm a physicist by training, so which so, is okay. which is also pretty rare. So I was used to being the only girl in the room. Um, I don't know, 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, but therefore, you know, to I remember that I saw the first idea about quantum computers 30 years ago, and now here we are, and we are building quantum computers. I mean, that's insane, but it's very cool. But a physicist, I, I'm I'm certain you don't run into so many of those in the no. venture and no, especially not in my age. <laughs> so so let's talk let's talk about cars of the future i'm super excited about speaking to you about this um you know they've been described um as everything from smartphones on wheels to these to all of the self-driving possibilities um to of course all of the language about you know they're dormant they sit in parking lots and they sit in driveways you know how can we make them non-dormant and all of this is is very exciting but you know, it gets me thinking that there, there must be challenges around around them and also challenges uh, uh, around being an investor in that sector. Again, because these these ideas are so, in a way, audacious. So talk to me about the challenges of being an investor in this sector. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I sometimes I feel like, you know, investing in, you know, like consumer focused might be easier, but I think everyone has their own um, challenges. Yeah. I mean, specifically in the auto or mobility space, if you are working as a startup, if you want to work with a large OEM like GM or VW, then you really have to know what's how the industry works you have to know that the development cycles of a new vehicle is like five to seven years so even though you have customer attraction and the customers like your product um, it takes at least five to seven years until this becomes a product in a vehicle and probably eventually like reoccurring revenue or or license based revenue kicks in only in a couple of years so you have to bridge the time in between with either you know, investors money alone or or some non reoccurring um, engineering focused revenue called NREs. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. And that's also why for us as investors, we are like very, very cautious um, about investing in that space since um, we also want to see a return of our investment at some point. Right. Um, so that's 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 a challenge for sure. Um, another challenge we also see is, um, you know, in the mobility space, many of the startups, they they have the, the automotive industry. It's difficult to understand, you know, how this tier business works. So if a startup, they approach an, an OEM, for example, and they have this cool new, I don't know, LiDAR technology, just as an example, mm -hmm. the OEM probably loves it and it he works with a startup for a proof of concept or so but at the end the oem is not buying from a startup the oems want to buy from a established tier one yeah. and then they actually they they push this down the value chain to the tier one or maybe even to the tier two to work with that startup um, but maybe the tier one has other problems to solve and doesn't want to work with the startup so the startup is then stuck in between the oem wants me but the tier one does not or has no. not the bandwidth to work with me so that's that's a challenge yes but it's not it's not unpos impossible but it's challenging and it's important to understand the dynamics of this market what's interesting it it's also sounds to me that having a a very 
savvy set of investors who are educated about this space probably helps you navigate those problems too. Yeah, yeah, right? of course, of course. Give me a sense of, I mean, there's a lot of disruption happening in the space. Like I said, a, a ton of this is, is super interesting. How are large established automotive companies um, viewing this disruption and, and how do you think they are addressing it? Yeah. Um, I mean, large organizations are not the fastest, right? So years ago, many, many years ago, when Tesla started their own, like we can build cars, many OEMs were like, you know, wait for them to go away again. Um, but here we are 2022 and Tesla is not going away any, anywhere, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they are very, very strong and, uh, and they are very, very different. They are very verticalized. So the OEMs are looking at Tesla and they are like, I don't know, some, something, something like they have to do something very similar, like VW, they built their own, um, their own subsidiary Cariat to, to build a similar structure with a very, very verticalized solution. So they, to some extent, try to copy Tesla. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and other OEMs are doing this as well, or tier ones as well. So they are separating the more traditional business from the new business, which is electric, um, um, um autonomy um communication and shared mobility um and then one other thing what most of the oems the big ones and the tier ones are doing is they work with startups um mm, internal that's opportunity oh, of that's course, internal startups what we call intrapreneurs in our company or also external startups so they all in the meantime most of them develop like innovation platforms where in the company smart people can pitch their ideas that they want to you know try out a new business and they have very good ideas um, or working with external startups and helping them to develop something together with a corporation and then also doing this together with a venture arm like like Bosch is doing because the venture arm is also a very good um, complement to bring more innovation to the corporation. So most of the OEMs in tier one are doing this nowadays. So let's let's uh, look forward a little. Where do you think the puck is going in, in smart mobility? What do you see? Um, you know, if, you, if you're looking at a crystal ball, what do you see? Um, I, want to, I want to answer with what I want to see. <laughs> you know what? Actually, I'd love to know what you want to see <laughs> and what and you think and, what you yeah. think you're gonna see. What I want to see is is also like, of course, um, driven also by very, very personal, you know, problems I have, like, you know, coming to work without my car, hmm, difficult. You know, there's still not enough um good bike lanes. Um, there is no public transportation, especially here on the West Coast, like in, in Europe. Um, there are some bike lanes, but you are probably getting killed because people, you know, they, they are not used to, to bikes, to, to bicycles. So they don't see you because they're just not used to it. Uh, I would like to see better public, private and some something in between infrastructure to solve um, the traffic problem. I mean, Two years of COVID, we kind of like try to ignore and forget the traffic issues we had in the Bay Area or in the LA area and metropolitan area. It's even worse. I mean, for me, going to San Francisco for a meeting during the week, it's almost impossible in some hours because it takes me two hours one way or three hours. So I would love to see smarter solutions here. That's a challenge because that's also probably infrastructure heavy, and that means it needs a lot of investment. Um, but but, that, but it almost involves a rethink, yeah. right? A rethink of the idea of transportation. Yeah, hmm. totally. I mean, you know, like, why do I need a car, a privately owned vehicle? I mean, guilty, I have one, um, but it's standing in the driveway for 23 hours a day. Um, because my total commute is not too much. So yeah. I hope that there will be better models in the near future to, to better utilize the, you know, the assets we have. What's interesting, um, you know, you're the second interview that I'm doing with, with, uh, on the, on this event today. And 
both of you have brought this point of, of, the, of the dormant assets. And, and I hear it so often from people that are not even in technology, realizing that they have this thing. So I, I do think that there's an appetite. Anecdotally, I think that from what I hear, I think that there's an appetite for, for solutions. Now, you've talked about what you would like to see. What do you think you're going to see? Um, what I, what I'm currently seeing, and, and this is, I mean, more, maybe more baby steps because, you know, and it's, and it's both, I see also startups who have this big vision to build a new infrastructure, like a, a alternative to existing public transportation. Um, there are some companies who are daring to do it, but it's actually really, really hard. And as I said, you know, they need big, big partners, infrastructure partners to pull this off. Um, but what I also see is many other startups, and it's all important, very technology heavy, for example, building better power electronics, building better ma battery mm -hmm. management system, building better um, distribution of hydrogen for fuel cell driven cars, because th the least we can do is uh, to eliminate combustion engines and replace them with um, with electric or, or hydrogen based vehicles um, and you know Bosch was researching in, in hydrogen for many many years Bosch had fuel cell activities 20 years ago they kind of stopped it and people did believe it's not going anywhere and now here we are again um, and and we believe and we think that hydrogen is, is is part of the puzzle because you know large large trucks for example they probably don't run with lithium ion batteries because it becomes too heavy so that's what i'm going to, what i see and that's very very exciting too so i'm going to just stop here because i get carried away sometimes with questions i have a ton more for you i just want to say that if anyone listening um, has a question uh, for yvonne uh, please uh, drop it into the chat and I'll make sure into comments and I'll make sure even if it's a comment um, or you just want to wish her happy birthday, which some folks have, have said here, uh, please do. Uh, and I'll make sure that I that I put it to Yvonne. So Yvonne, let's talk about women in investment. Um, so I'm going to read off a, a stat to you about, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you've you've heard this before. This is not news to you. We know that uh, companies uh, companies founded solely by women garnered only 2% of dollars invested in, in VC startups uh, in, in the U.S. throughout the year. Um, it's not good. It's not looking good. Uh, for, let's start here. How many women technology founders pitch to you and at the venture team at, at Bosch? And, and are there any trends that you see in your investments with, with women-led tech companies that, that you think would be interesting to the entrepreneurs that are on the call with us today? Um, I did not count them, um, to be honest, but I think this 2% is probably also what we see in the pitches. Okay. Um, but of course, we see female CEOs once in a while, and I personally am always very, very excited. Mm -hmm. um, I already think it's um, it's helpful for them if there is also a female investor in the room because they, then they don't feel like being dropped on the wrong planet. Um, what can we do? I don't. I think it's it's difficult. You know, I was always wondering. You know, what can we do to to aim? you know, to, to encourage more women to, to sure. go this route. Um, I mean, what I can always say and what I also had to learn through my journey, like just be, be bolder, be more brave because men are this as well. Just do it and don't be afraid to make fun of yourself in some way. Um, because, yeah, no, we, we like to say in Germany, actually, no risk, no fun. Um, but I think um, so. I think that's that's very important um, to be bold um, and to go out. Um, we have in our portfolio we have a handful of female um, um, CEOs. Um, for us, it it was not an important decision for the investment. I have to say because we invest in a good startup and in a strong CEO, whether whether it's a he, whether it's female, male, or 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 whatever gender. Um, but I, I personally see that the female CEOs are, I don't know, maybe because I'm biased. Um, mm -hmm. I, I see them being very, very inclusive. They have a sense for their team, 
for the team energy, um, not to leave people behind, um, but also to make important and, and hard decision if necessary. So I'm very, very impressed by, by our female CEO so far. It's interesting that you say that uh, in two other interviews that I've done uh, for, at Invest Ottawa sessions with, with um, female CEOs of tech companies, both of them have stressed the importance. I found very interesting because I haven't heard it from other people as much, but both those female CEOs um, stress the importance of when you start your company, ensuring that there was a, a diversity of viewpoints and diversity of people at the table, um, because that then becomes how the rest of your company is shaped up. I, I just thought that was really fascinating to hear it from both of them. But let, let's talk about the other thing that you just mentioned, which is that, you know, in some of the cases when you're sitting in on a pitch, you're the only woman at the other side of the table listening to the pitch. And again, you know, there's, there's some stats on this. Again, numbers that you probably know. Research shows that only 15% of partners in, in venture capital funds are women. Um, how do you think we can attract more women investors to smart mobility uh, and, and, and investment? I really, simply put, how do we create more of you? Um, I think it's two, two things we can do. One thing is to foster STEM education in every, in every area you can, like whether it's going to schools um, and explaining kids about you know STEM education and and how fascinating technology can be, and reaching you know boys but also girls there, um, and and to 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 motivate them to go into this area. Um, I do this a lot. Um, and the other thing is just to be out there and just not to be like you know sitting in my corner, but you know taking opportunities like this one and speaking, um, and showing younger uh, women or women earlier in their career that that we can do the same and we are the same successful as men. I think the term role model um, cannot be over evaluated. Uh, when I was young, I thought I don't need role models, but then I grew a little bit more mature and I realized I never had role models. But then if I don't have a role model, how can I like have the fantasy to go there, to go in that space, to, to become mm -hmm. a VC, that this, that this door is open. So just being there and being on the stage um, to show that we can do that, I think that's very important. So you, thanks for this, you know, for the stage, right? Yvonne, are you seeing changes there? I mean, I, I feel like I've been doing interviews of this kind for a while now, for a couple of years, um, yeah. you know, are you seeing? Are you seeing more? May, perhaps you're seeing more angel investors, or are you seeing more women appear on that venture capital stage? I mean, you've been doing it for a couple of years now yeah. with with a sizable firm. I see changes, um, but it takes you know it takes very very long time. I know that now nowadays, for example, you know, just starting from the education system, I know that nowadays there are more girls in physics than at my time when I started studying. Um, and so if you have more people, more, more women in the, you know, like as from the baseline, then you can also have more people, uh, more women, um, in the top of, of companies. And then also as, as VCs, um, but it takes a long time. And that's why, you know, I always discuss with my friends, with male or female friends about, you know, whether we should, you know, um, put any, you know, like quotas anywhere, you know, whether we want to invest in so many female led companies or whether we want to hire more women uh, VCs. And many people are very much against it because they always think then that you are getting like underqualified, non qualified people, but that's not true. I, mm. I, I mean, there are so many unqualified men. Um, <laughs> I'm not concerned about the quality of, 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 of women, not at all. So I think this, you know, to overcome and to accelerate having more women in the field, we have to be a little bit more biased or more picky in, in hiring more women. Interesting. Um, I have a question here that I'm going to read out from um, Ira uh, 
Abraham, I hope I pronounced your name right. Her question is, what suggestions do you have to give to female founders in startups leveraging partnerships or collaboration to drive potential sales in this space? In, in the mobility space or? Yes, in the, I, I would imagine it's the, uh, she hasn't qualified that, but I would imagine uh, because of the, of the uh, event we're at that it would be in the smart mobility space. Um, wow, that's, that's, I, that's very, very broad. Um, I mean, if it's about driving sales, I'm not a sales expert. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, learning from experts, um, utilizing whatever network you have, um, and talking to, you know, figuring out and talking to, to women or men who did that before who were executives, um, or high level VPs, whatever in these, in these roles in the past. And don't be shy to reach out to them on LinkedIn or, or wherever and to ask them for, I don't know, for, for ask them out for a coffee, ask them whether they want to share their experiences. Um, I realized, and this is also something when I came from Germany and came to US to Silicon Valley, reaching out to people and asking them for a coffee and asking them for advice. Everyone is open for this one first meeting and to help you and you should really, really utilize that. Mm. That's really interesting, that idea of, of, of building that network. And I would imagine that, that you know, I think the idea is that partnerships are important, whether it's individual partnerships that, that help inform your leadership or partnerships for your, for your company to drive, to, to drive sales, I think, I think are, are really important. So, you know, we have a, a couple of minutes left, um, and I'm certain that there are many uh, entrepreneurs and, and innovators that are on the call today who would love to know, I'm sure this is the question you get very often, how to pitch to, to, to Robert Rush, uh, Venture Capital. What would you like to say to them today? How can people uh, pitch effectively to your organization and be heard? Um, I mean, there are so many guidebooks and, and pitch decks and whatever as good examples out there. I'm not repeating that. No. Um, what's that magic, the, the magic that you look for? The magic is to have a real problem on hand and a real solution where you know from talking to customers, to potential customers very early that this is a problem they really want to have solved. Um, I did this you know, we did some in-house innovation projects also in the past and very, very early, we just went out to the street and asked people about a potential solution. This is so helpful just to go out and talk to random people to figure out whether this is a, a problem they see and the problem they want to get solved. Um, this is really eye-opening. So having a good problem and a good solution, um, that's very important. Um, Having an idea about Robert Bosch Venture Capital, about the Bosch Corporation, having an idea about strategic fit um, is also very important um, because it's, it's about the preparation, right? Um, we, our portfolio is public information. It's on our website. Um, and then having an idea about you know, the spaces we are investing in um, is very, very helpful for us um, and for, for the startup as a preparation. And uh, last but not least, know your competition. Yes. Um, we see, I mean, you know, there are topics, there are areas where we see not one pitch, we see like 10 pitches in this area. And, you know, sometimes I forget the names of the other startups, but I know I saw two, I saw five more. And if then the startup comes to me and say that they don't have competition, yeah. then they lose credibility. Got it. So you and and you need to be able to say this is who we compete with and this is how we differentiate yeah, and, ourselves. And from they them. have a differentiator. They have a USP. They are convinced. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. And that's and yeah. that's totally fine. So show me the competition, but also show me your USP. I'm right. so glad you said that, Yvonne, about the the competition bit because I sometimes interview people and they say, "Well, there's no company like us," or "or there's no competition." I think. I don't think so. Yeah. so. And you know, the thing is, if there's no competition, they're probably in a not in a no market, right? In a, in a way, competition validates the space that you're in. To some that extent. is so true. So true. You've been such a pleasure to chat with. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. 
Thank you, Manjula. I hope you do. Uh, it's really lovely that you were able to spend a portion of your birthday with us. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that we get a chance to chat again. Yes, totally. So I'm going to hand the mic back to, to Rebecca. Rebecca, wasn't that fascinating? It was very inspiring. A lot of information um, yeah, was had. A lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like to thank both yourself, Mandela, as well as Yvonne for joining us today um, on that very insightful discussion. Investor fireside um, chats are among the most sought after by the founders and entrepreneurs that we serve at Invest Ottawa. So thank you both for joining us. Okay, we are going to take one final brief break as we prepare for our concluding keynote panel building a more diverse and inclusive smart mobility industry. If everyone can please join us back here for 4.09 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you for joining us for our final keynote session of the day, building a more diverse and inclusive smart mobility industry. If everyone can please join me in welcoming back to the stage, Sonia Shori, Vice President of Strategy, Marketing and Communications here at Ariax.O and Invest Ottawa. Welcome, Sonia. 
Thank you so much, Rebecca. Incredible job today. And of course, every day at Ariex.O. I am so privileged to bring this incredible day to a close with this panel discussion. When I listen to all the amazing leaders that have been woven through the last four hours of today, it is such an inspiration. They say, if you see her, you can be her. Well, we have seen her and she is leading the smart mobility revolution. She is driving progress. She is making our world better and using technology for good. And when I think about this panel and the leaders that I'll welcome in a moment, they are really the embodiment of how to drive forward on that big picture goal of creating a more diverse and inclusive pool of talent for this sector and to ensure that there is a space for absolutely everyone. When I was listening to some of the previous discussion um, and just amazing, Yvonne, the expertise that she was bringing, we actually have established a Women Founders and Owners Strategy at Invest Ottawa. I'm really privileged to work with a subcommittee of our board. And our goal is to enable and equip more women founders from every walk of life to grow, scale, and succeed commercially um, with $100 million technology companies. We want the first one that is led and owned by a woman here in Ottawa in the next two to three years. And also on the other side of that equation to ensure that we are building up the pool of, of women investors because research shows if you have more women investing on that one side of the table, more women absolutely get funded. And so it's a really important part of that equation. And when we look across the landscape today, there are some incredible examples of women founders. I'm about to share some I'm with you and introduce them and invite them to be a part of the next panel. But you see high profile women like Raquel Ersteson, founder and CEO of Wabi, $100 million, one of the largest investments in Canadian history by a startup. Tadika Mekawana from, from co-CEO of Waymo. Uh, and of course, from Zooks, Aisha Evans, uh, the CEO. Incredible women from every walk of life. And they are complementing all of the topics and the themes and driving forward on that leadership goal. We can create them, we must create them, and we must support them. Women helping women, founders helping founders is absolutely key. And so it's my honor and pleasure to bring forward amazing women leaders who are doing just that. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Cheryl and Christine. Thank you so much for being with us today for this closing keynote that truly brings this incredible day to a close and brings all of the important goals that I know we have talked about extensively leading up to today to bear. I would love it if you would each introduce yourselves, your role and your organization, and tell us about one incredibly defining moment as leaders in smart mobility that you think ultimately defines a big part of your leadership journey in this space. Michelle, we've collaborated so closely now for several years. Welcome, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Michelle, I'm president of Women in Auto Tech. Um, what really led me into kind of the mobility space was actually after grad school, I came from the, um, the defense and aerospace industry, and actually it's also dominated by men. But what it was really interesting was I got to lead and build a business innovation program and just the joy that I got to see from, you know, people who wanted to join the program and work with my group and also, um, you know, the joy actually I got for, for myself to lead this organization um, was the reason why I kind of went into mobility. I think actually being able to use your product, being um, a consumer of mobility in the automotive space has kind of helped me connect um, with the industry. And that's kind of helped me lead Amazing. Thank you so much. And you are doing incredible work with the community that you serve at Women in Automotive Tech. Cheryl, welcome. We met, of course, through one of our incredible fellow panelists, Jen Teasdale from Grimm. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, Cheryl Thompson, founder and CEO of Cadia, and Cadia is the Center for Automotive Diversity, Inclusion and Advancement. And I come with a, a very long background in traditional automotive. 31 years at Ford Motor Company and a year and a half at American Axle and Manufacturing. I also had a non-traditional career path. I came into Ford through food service when that was still uh, in in house, and then had an opportunity to um, join a an apprenticeship. So I got to be a, a skilled trade, a tool and die apprentice, and then later a journey person. And then that was a great foundation for engineering. So my career has been operations, a little product development and manufacturing engineering. So what drove me to start this organization and, and what helped me see the need 
to really be focusing on uh, inclusion, number one, equity and diversity. And the, the importance of it was I got stuck at a certain level. When I became an engineering supervisor, I thought, great, I've, I've achieved, you know, the success and I'm, I'm fine where I'm at. And I had a great leader who kept pushing me. And he said, you know, you're ready to be a manager. And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. I don't see any other women leading. I thought I was going to have to act like him. And back in those days, it was a little bit more old school. And I wanted nothing to do with acting like a man. <laughs> so, um, you know, he... <laughs> looked at me, you know, just so genuinely and just said, kid, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll try to get you some help. And he linked me up with a female executive VP who, you know, really rocked my world. And her best piece of advice to me was, you don't have to play the game, but you can't change the game until you get into the game, right? So that was really my defining moment and what drives so much of my work today. Incredible. I am so looking forward to unpacking more about Cadia and the change that you're seeing in this ecosystem. Christine, welcome. You have a very accomplished career as, a, as an entrepreneur, a serial founder. I'm very excited to hear from you. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm Christine Moon, co-founder and president of BlueSpace.ai. We're based out of California. We provide uh, what we call Bliss System, Blue Space Independent Safety System for Autonomy. Um, so how, let, a little background on myself. Um, I grew up in South Korea, but came to the U.S. when I was little. And since then, I've uh, kind of uh, spanned across many different cities, uh, starting my career uh, in uh, in New York, going to Hong Kong, coming back uh, to uh, for grad school in Connecticut, and then uh, making my way to Silicon Valley in 2004 when I joined uh, Google. I was there for about nine years before moving on to other tech companies like uh, Dropbox, Free IPO, and Color Health, and. Uh, and, and dipping my toe into uh, autonomy when I uh, was at Drive.ai, which was a full AV stack company spun out of Stanford AI lab. Um, in 2019, um, Drive.ai became part of Apple, which gave my co-founder Joel and I a chance to walk this journey of uh, founding BlueSpace.ai. Um, and to answer your earlier question of when was that pivotal moment, I think for me it was incremental. Uh, all the life experiences of seeing and all the folks who took a chance on me. Um, it, it's not always um, females uh, who support female only. I think it could have been uh, that manager who gave me the opportunity to expand my skill sets and leadership opportunities. It's females and males who support each other. And then being able to be where I am thanks to all the support that we've gotten, which is the topic for uh, our panel today. How do we support, support and include many others? I completely agree with you and echo that my career in tech, which started at Nortel Networks, which goes back quite a ways, telecommunications is, of course, at the heart of uh, part of our tech cluster and uh, hub here. There were many champions and allies who helped to lift me up and help me move forward in a space where I wasn't an engineer. I came as a journalism graduate uh, and was working my way forward in different parts of, of that, that company. Incredible to have the kind of champions that you were just describing. And that's also a very important part of our panel today. I wanted to also just send out our sincere uh, wishes to Amanda Negrobano, the chairperson at the National Physical Planning Board. She is in Uganda and she was recognized by Vulog as one of the top influential women in mobility for 2022. We regret that there are some technical challenges that prohibited her from joining today. We look forward to welcoming you to a future engagement and, and working with you and shining a spotlight on your incredible work, Amanda. We're gonna start off today by a little bit of a state of the union. As leaders, you're all working actively right now to create a more diverse, inclusive and competitive smart mobility industry. Where do you really believe we are? And I wanna throw out a statistic that I've researched. Forbes 2021, only 8.2% of autonomous tech companies have women CEOs and women of color, it's less than 1%. That's dismal and it absolutely must change. So when I saw that statistic, it certainly left me with a feeling of we're not moving this dial fast enough. You're all working on the ground in the industry in very deep ways. Cheryl, you've launched Cadia for this exact reason. Maybe you could kick us off. Yes, um, so I'm not surprised by those statistics that you just rattled off. I see the very same thing in 
different parts of the automotive industry. Um, when we look at vehicle manufacturers and part manufacturers, um, not only do we not see female CEOs, we don't see females in the C-suite at all. And that leadership pipeline looks like a pyramid, right? There's, there's good diversity and, and good representation at the entry level. But unfortunately, women are falling off of that career ladder at that very first step, you know, into leading people, that people management side. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. When I look at the industry overall, I'm really encouraged because people are starting their journey. And I like to look at a maturity model and, and look at levels one through five. And I would say many companies are at one and a half to two, but there are quite a few that are moving into that two to three space. And what I'm encouraged by is the involvement from leaders, leaders you know, of all types, uh, male, female, um, um, uh, all champions and allies, really looking to solve this problem, really making a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, not only financial, but resources in terms of time, focus, and attention. And I'm seeing that top down and bottom up approach. So I'm encouraged. Um, I was starting to see momentum before the pandemic hit because of some external forces investors are asking the question, right? There's a, a lot of investment firms have said, we're not going to invest in companies. What is it? No IPOs with boards with all bros. <laughs> we're, we're just seeing that external pressure, but, but now we're starting to see the pressure come from em, uh, employees, uh, potential employees. They have the ability to look on a company's website and see, is there any diversity there? They can also look at the board and they're voting with their feet. Um, they're not choosing to join companies where they don't see diversity or at least a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. So I would say we're still early, but I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing. That is marvelous to hear because you are working very, very broadly across this sector and have so much deep um, heritage, I guess I would say, within those big OEMs and tier ones that you know the culture that has been created over decades. So that's an incredibly encouraging sign. Christine, you're working in the heart of Silicon Valley, surrounded by founders and investors every single day. I would love your perspective on this. Yeah, I think it's the ecosystem, right? Um, we think about, uh, I have two twin daughters who are in middle school, and um, I think about how many uh, you know, uh, minorities or um, females go into STEM, how many pursue that as a major uh, during school, and how many pursue that, how many stay in the workforce, and how many make it to the top, and how many venture venture out to say, I want to do a startup. I think in the earlier sessions today, um, we learned that, you know, uh, female uh, founded companies get 2% of the overall VC funding. And I think this is very telling. Um, and I think um, they also also said, well, out of the ones who are pitching to us, it's, it's you know, proportionally less. And I think this goes back to um, how can we support each other, um, starting at school, uh, starting at the workplace, starting with the venture capitalists who can fund people of different backgrounds and uh, of for women and then having that support system because we wear many different hats. We're a mom, we're a, we're a partner. Uh, we also participate in nonprofit activities. So how do we make sure that uh, we can we can have it all, but make sure uh, we can have it all in a way that's sane. You know, I, I used to tell myself, what doesn't break me, you know, makes me stronger. But during the pandemic, we saw a lot of folks breaking. Um, we were the head of an IT manager for our kids' school, Zooming at home. We were the head of a chef, cleaner, and shopper, and everything else, you know, continues. So I do think that um, we, more than ever, while we have been making progress in the grand scheme of things, I think the pandemic highlighted um, the state of the union of women, the many hats and responsibilities we hold. And I think there needs to be a, a way for all of us to come together to really address how can we make it easier and better for folks so we can be very productive and effective in what we do. Incredible. You've actually started to unpack some of the challenges that we know research is, is unveiling in so many different spheres and certainly in tech, all the different hats that women wear, the challenges around investment, needing more women making investment strategies to help do that so that more women get funded. We're going to come back to that and unpack that with you. Michelle, you opened up today by describing the founding of women in automotive tech uh, literally being based on a bet. 
about how many women in automotive and tech they could find to pull together. And now you're building this incredible community surrounded and in including many of the speakers who have joined us today. Tell us what you're seeing on the ground within your community. I think there's a huge push. There's definitely people in the industry have recognized, you know, there needs to be more women and whether it's uh, for financial purposes or, you know, the health of their company or morally, you know, we just want more equality. Um, there's a huge push. There's more marketing. There's more scholarships for women in kind of STEM and there's quotas for, you know, bringing people in um, starting their career. I think so. We, we recognize that part and think they're slowly starting to hit those goals. And then I think there's enough studies to show that, you know, organizations with more women in the C-suite in making these critical roles are more profitable and are more socially responsible, um, provide safer, higher quality customer experience. So there's this like gap. OK, you want more women on top and then we're bringing more women on the bottom, but I think without any culture change, you know, it, it's hard to, uh, you know, a lot of women, they're gonna come in, they're gonna go into an environment that was created really for, for men. Um, and then they're gonna opt out, I think. And so I think putting women on top, but then also being open to listen, to have them being heard and have them change the culture is really key to having women kind of move all the way up. In the bottom. I, I resonate with that so much, having women in decision-making roles with authority to be able to help influence and drive that change at a faster pace uh, together with other champions and allies is absolutely critical. And I would really like to unpack some of the challenges and barriers that you've all been describing. I had dinner with an incredible mentor uh, last week. She's at the top of MDA, which is an incredible technology company here in Canada. Uh, and she was, I were we're discussing how important it is for women to share stories about the challenges that they've experienced, how they've come through them so that other women coming up in the next generation can learn and not be afraid to have those discussions or seek help or look for mentorship and guidance as they're happening. Could you each share a story about some of the challenges and barriers either that you've seen in your career or that you've seen others that perhaps you've mentored or collaborated with. Stories really capture the heart and mind and help people to understand the kind of challenge we're talking about and putting it into context. I don't know who would like to begin, but I'd love to hear some stories. Well, I'll start. Um, Sonia, I, I love that you spoke to the fact we need to see more women in decision-making roles. Absolutely. I think that is what's gonna make all the difference. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, people in decision making roles are deciding who's hired, who gets development and advancement, um, can push back on maybe some um, performance reviews and bias that may show up there. So I, I love that you brought that up. I think the the challenges and obstacles just in my experience is being underestimated um, and, you know, working for someone that had very low expectations of me. And human nature is you either rise or lower to those expectations, you know, versus when I work for someone that had very high expectations of me, it changed everything. So I, th I think having a champion that you're working for that's really challenging you and pushing you is really important, but that doesn't always happen. Um, so I think that's a, a challenge. The other challenge is um, there's a myth out there that there are no women in technology. Oh, you know, there's just, we can't find women out there. Um, these are really tough jobs or these are really highly technical fields and there's just not women graduating. And we know that's not true. <laughs> you know, at, this, at the same time, we see a lot of young women coming out of school, not even knowing the opportunities are out there. So I just had a, a recent interaction with Detroit Crystal Ray, which is doing some um, phenomenal work in the Detroit area with high schoolers and giving them exposure to opportunities that are in all kinds of fields. And there was a, a woman that um, did a work study program um, with an employer, and she had been enrolled in school to learn how to be a nurse. And once she got exposed to, wow, I, I can, you mean I could be an engineer? She changed her degree program, she became an engineer, and now she's working on the Ford Bronco launch. So I just thought that was such an amazing story. It's just awareness and access to opportunity. 
I could not agree more that inspiration and actionable insight much earlier in the educational system. How can we inspire young girls from every walk of life, you know, K to 12 and into that university career, that college choice? I'd actually like to send the content from today's event to every college, university and high school in Canada and hopefully work with women in automotive tech to take on something similar in the US. The inspiration that has channeled through this last four hours is amazing. And I believe it could change the trajectory of a lot of young women who would have the opportunity to see it. So that's something we're gonna be coming back to you on. Michelle, can you share a story? You work with so many amazing women through the community at Women in Automotive Tech, plus you're an entrepreneur yourself working in stealth mode currently. I'm excited to hear a story from you. Well, I kind of see um, some of our, um, let's see, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of a, a better story. I'll, I'll come back. We'll come back, Christine. Uh, I do have stories to give Michelle some. I'm sure she has so many ideas that she's trying to pick which one. Um, I, I want I want to um, share stories of struggle, um, and I actually want to um, rephrase what I said before. Um, having it all creates um, too much pressure. Uh, it makes it seem like you have to have your, your clean house, perfect figure, super fit. Ha you know, like today, we all look like pretty all dolled up and you, know, you don't know what I'm wearing underneath, but um, that pressure, right? Um, so you don't need to have it all, but I do want everyone to really realize all their potential. And what I see happening for young women at workplace is that they are having to choose career or family. And for older women like myself, having to be the caretaker of my aging parents, uh, more demands at home, and then uh, wanting to do some self-care for myself as well, right? So I do want to create a, a, a place where it's safe to talk about our struggles. I remember uh, when I was at Google, I, uh, I had all my three kids there, and I was on a business trip in Madrid. This was to attend uh, Mobile World Congress, and um, we had back-to-back -back partner meetings. And I um, there was no mother's room. I was, uh, my, my twins were one year old at the time, and I had to go in between breaks, get, get in line, and as, as always, women's bathroom lines are long, and use one of the bathroom stalls to pump milk. And unless you're a mom, you don't know what that entails, but it entails a lot of um, effort to set it all up. And I was late to the partner meeting, and my manager, you know, it was all men, team, at the time asked me, Christine, why are you late to these partner meetings? And at the time, I froze. I didn't know what to say. I thought it was TMI for me to be like, well, I was in the bathroom, trying to pump my <laughs> breast milk. So at the time, I couldn't say anything. And I realized to my manager's eyes, I looked like the incompetent person who was late to partner meetings, not prepared and irresponsible. And I guess I, I share this story because I think we, we, we do things behind the scenes. I think we should create a space where it's okay to share the struggles of the demands of who we are wearing multiple hats. And, and that's for many others, you know, not just for women. So I, I, I put it out there in the public because I think we throughout life, we're going to constantly uh, be pulled into many different directions. And as a leader, uh, male or female, we should create a, a, an open communication where it's inclusive to be able to share, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all 100% today, but there are days when I can't be for other reasons, and that's okay because I will pick pick up and, and do well again. And um, being more human from that perspective is what I would share today. I resonate with this so, so much, um, creating a safe space, uh, a space where women can grow and thrive as women with all of the unique needs, challenges. Every human being manages something differently. When I started my career at Nortel, coming out as a new graduate in that journalism English background, I literally on my first day walked into a room with probably 150 men. There wasn't a single other woman in the room. I felt very uncomfortable and I certainly was not made to feel like I belonged. And I went home crying probably every single night for the first six months, wondering if I would actually continue in this field. And several senior male leaders took me under their wing and started to give me a sense of belonging and give me time and mentorship. And it changed my life. 
that experience changed my life in every single way. It was the most formative experience of my life. So how can we create that kind of environment, that kind of culture for the up and coming women and for women today who might be looking for a new opportunity in smart mobility or advancement or to make a career change? I think we all have those stories and making it safe to share them so that other women coming up don't feel afraid to have those conversations or reach out. Absolutely critical. Okay, I have my story now. <laughs> so I guess um, I kind of grew up, you know, being taught, you know, you work hard and you don't complain and that's how you move up. You know, I think that's maybe true for a lot of women. That's kind of your role. And that what that kind of causes, you know, in a lot of I feel tech and engineering environment is a lot of men will talk over you. And I think one experience, um, the founder of Women in um, Auto Tech, Michelle Avery, she was a, someone in senior position. And when I wanted to talk, she actually even to execs would go, you know, Michelle was talking, you know, everybody listen to what she said. And, you know, to put her out, herself out and kind of in front of an executive and make that move, I think was very bold of her for someone who's a lot more junior to just have her opinion out. And it, that meant so much to me. And I see she does that for all women when I was working with her, when she asked me to join and take a board role in women in auto tech, I said, you know, for all that she's done for me, you know, yes, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to try and, you know, put all my effort because she took that risk on me. Courage and just being bold. So boldness is a word that has come up. Bravery is a word that has come up. Um, so many of, of the women that have joined us today, including all of you, live that every single day and serve as a role model for so many others. And it's a great segue into some of the strategies and the actions that we can encourage those who are with us today and those in the sector to undertake more broadly. I mentioned at the opening of the panel, we've developed a women founders and owners strategy and with intention have been targeting and building up program services uh, and all of the what I'll call supporting infrastructure and mentors that are required to make it a safe space for women to launch and grow companies in Ottawa. We have a long way to go. It's a journey as everything that's worthwhile is. What are some of the strategies that either you are all championing or that you're a part of or seeing and applauding that those who are with us today could learn from that create that pipeline of women leaders in all facets of the smart mobility sector, whether it's being entrepreneurs, policymakers, leading not-for-profits uh, and corporations like what you've launched, Cheryl? I'd love to hear from you on that. Well, I think community is so, so important. And I want to touch on what Christine and Michelle just um, brought up this this idea of struggle and I think women we hold our own selves back sometimes because we think we have to be perfect and that's understandable because like you Sonia we're walking into rooms where we're usually the only female and that can be a lot of pressure to perform and we and we feel like if we make a mistake then we've ruined it for our whole gender <laughs> right and they're going to be see you can't have women in these leadership roles um, so I think community helps helps that um, that that idea that we we think we have to be perfect. It was probably 25 years into my career before I heard women talking for real about the struggles. Right, I would sit on all these, listen to all these panel discussions, and and women were just kind of coming off with this brave front. There's no issues. Everything's fine. Um, I'm not interrupted or talked over. You just have to use your voice. And I would think there was something wrong with me. So I think community and sharing these stories and struggles are so, so important. And then, Michelle, when you were talking about being talked over, I was talked over and interrupted for so many years that when I finally got the chance to speak up, I had PTSD. I, I like couldn't speak right? because I was so used to being interrupted. So I, I think the power of community is is huge, is huge. So, you know, that's what that's what we're working on in terms of um, creating community within within Cadia. That's one piece of it. I spoke to the leadership part of it, really educating leaders, helping them see the obstacles and barriers that they may not have seen through their lived experience 
and giving them an opportunity to participate in something like an executive listening session where their role is just to sit and listen. They can't jump in to try to problem solve, but we want them to understand those obstacles and barriers. And then the third piece of it is the systemic change. What needs, because it's, it's I, I don't remember why I heard it, it may have been you, Michelle, that said, you know, it's not only male dominated, but male designed, right? We're in these male designed um, industries and we have to look at things like work-life flexibility um, so that women aren't forced to choose between family and career. We have to look at benefits. We have to look at um, um, the bias that's hidden inside of every single system and every uh, decision point where a, a manager has a, a chance to make a decision. So it's got to be a multi-pronged approach because it is a very complex problem. It's taken us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to get out. Absolutely. So those are excellent, very tactical and practical suggestions of things that any individual company, organization or community can do. Such important cultural changes. Christine, we spend so much time at Invest Ottawa focusing on how we can build that pipeline of women founders from every walk of life. You mentioned the statistic 2% of women founded sole companies, you know, getting venture capital. If you look at women of color, it's not even, you know, a fraction of a percent. And that is something that absolutely must change. What kinds of strategies are you seeing in the entrepreneurial community in the Valley or broadly within your network around the world? And, and what can we take from that? What can we learn? Yeah, I, um, I want to go back to the ecosystem. It can't be just entrepreneurs. Like you said, it has to be the folks across the table who are assessing entrepreneurs to be able to say, hey, I want to fund that entrepreneur of that particular background because not only is it good for you know the uh, for our, their fund but for the whole society when there's more diversity and inclusion and and that results in uh, you know impact on the bottom line and more diverse solutions that benefits the society as a whole and i think creating that um, case study so that folks can see this isn't just a feel good do good kind of thing it's actually good for society overall. We have better outcomes as a result of that. And I love that there are studies done at year after year that show the benefits. And I think the more we repeat the facts, like the 2% stats, or how many women go into STEM, or how many women are in the, in the position of power or, or influence is good because that's a reminder for us that that number needs to change. And we all have to have, we all have a role in it impacting that. But I wanna go back to something that we said earlier about being talked over. So there are strategies where if we're in a conference room, somebody says something, that person gets ignored and somebody else, let's say, you know, I you know uh, John Doe says something, oh, that's a great idea, as if like what Jane said didn't matter or no one heard. So then if you're the other woman in the, in the, in the conference room or a person, a minority, just say, hey, what Cheryl said is great. Just repeat what she said. That's what she said exactly. And then give credit to her. And then those who are not highlighted, highlight their all their progress and contributions. Um, it, you don't have to be in a position of power. Give yourself the power. Take that voice back and amplify. And then also, um, there's so few of us in the, in, in the corporate world or you know elsewhere that we do have to go out of our way to really make some noise and let let us be heard. You know, let's not only highlight the few that we know who's always highlighted in the press and i think that's i mean i love it sonia you reached out to us and you made this happen and um i'm not anyone famous but you found us and i think that really goes to say hey there are women out there who is doing their part and amplify their effort because we together as a collective can do so much more you don't have to be oprah winfrey to have power we all have the power within our sphere to be that change maker I was just going to highlight that when I reached out to the speakers that joined us today, including you, Christine, you had never met me. I researched with attention. There's databases, Michelle, you know, her her community and different different champions that are pulling together lists and shining a spotlight on award winning women, on women who are changing the world. And you were one and you were so gracious in accepting, as all of you were, that invitation without any background. And that's women helping women. And I can't help but think about um, Madeleine Albright. 
um, you know, she's had such a tremendous impact and we honor her and her legacy. Uh, and the quote, there's a very special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And the women that are here today have truly come together to build up this community and drive women forward. So I could not be more grateful. Michelle, the work that you're leading in Women in Automotive Tech is dedicated to this goal and you're implementing different strategies and approaches and growing the base of Women in Automotive Tech. We're privileged to be a part of this expanding community with the pandemic, the virtual reach that you now have. Tell us a little bit about some of the strategies that you're talking about with your board. Well, actually, as uh, one of my board members this morning mentioned um, that, you know, what she calls... Um, metrics that are more masculine versus metrics that are more feminine as masculine be profitability and kind of optimization and efficiency i think those are what you know most vcs and even like boards are measuring companies by but we need to look at ones that are you know more community based metrics or building socially responsible organizations providing safety I think those are things that we also need to push and that will help, you know, help, help people see the value of putting on women because they kind of value those and they understand those. Once we build in those metrics, um, I think those would be really helpful for elevating women. Incredible observations. There's so many takeaways. I think we'll have to publish a blog with all of the incredible insight that has been channeled through today's event. Um, certainly, we've spent a lot of time talking about the development, attraction and retention of talent for the smart mobility sector, that we need more women who not only pursue, but stay and advance within this field. We've talked about things such as education, training and mentorship in the lead up to today. Talk to me a little bit about some of the most impactful strategies you think we can employ to build up that talent pipeline through that lens, whether it's mentorship, more communities of interest, more collaboration. What do you think are some of the most impactful ways we could address and build that talent pipeline for women? Well, I'll start. I think that uh, mentorship is uh, really important and teaching people how to mentor. That is important. Um, you know, mentors should be putting their mentees in high visibility roles, high credibility roles so that other people are seeing the great work that they're doing. Um, and and the, the woman who's getting mentored is getting that visibility and exposure that leads to advancement and she's building her confidence. So I think real mentorship uh, with some background for the mentors is important. Sponsorships, which is a little different than mentorship. I think, you know, there's that quote out there that women are over mentored and under sponsored. And, you know, sponsors, it's difficult to have a formal program. I think that sponsorship relationships come more authentically where you kind of earn a sponsor with your performance um, and, and somebody's investing in you, but they're then responsible for your career, making sure that you're going to take positions that are going to position you for advancement versus sideline you. Some companies are coming up with official sponsorship programs, again, with that structure in place to help train. And then um, some companies are looking at accelerator programs um, to have an accelerated path for development for females because they've got that goal out there that they want to meet. And then I think the last piece I'll say is it's really important to understand why women are falling off the career ladder. There's multiple reasons, but really digging into that and solving it just like you would any other engineering problem. You know, looking at that root cause and, um, you know, doing a, a fishbone analysis on it. <laughs> what is the root cause and, and the symptoms and, and really making sure we're solving for the root cause. I'm drawing on two guiding principles that you're touching on that are really at the heart of our diversity and inclusion strategy at Invest Auto and the work we're doing with women founders. Designing not for, but with and delivering not for, but with in everything that we do and lived experience, working with women from diverse walks of life who can speak to the real challenges that they face at different stages, different ages, different backgrounds, different sectors and industries and leadership roles. It's just absolutely critical. So thank you for that insight. Christine, you're recruiting. I see in your LinkedIn when I found you, you know, Blue Space, come join the rocket ship. I'm like, she's recruiting. She's in that talent mode. Tell us, tell us about your talent strategy and how you're managing that diversity and building up that pipeline. 
Yeah, I was like thinking about um, how will how diverse we are as a team. We're all nerds and techies, <laughs> but uh, I, I realize we have folks from like seven, eight different ethnic, uh, ethnicities and uh, c- country and heritage. And that makes me coming into work, I do come, I'm at work right now, uh, coming into work so fun and enjoyable. Um, startup journey, it, you know, it's a tough one. Highs are high, lows are low. Uh, but when you're, you know, walking that journey with folks that you enjoy their company and learn from, I think uh, it's great. But in terms of, um, you know, how do we hire for the best and also make sure that we're, you know, we don't have our blinders on. I think this is where uh, we ourselves have to check our assumptions you know our biases we all have all we all have them uh and then uh really um question them i think during the pandemic i think it made us a little more conservative given the downturn in the economics people are less willing to take risks um it also made us i think xenophobic in some ways because we're concerned about who's coming from where how, where have they traveled what are they bringing what kind of germs are they, they bringing with them so all those things have to be questioned and change it um and i think this is where if you see bs call it out challenge yourself um and i think what you said about if you can see her you can be her um yeah have more role models that and share your stories just like we're doing now so that more folks feel comfortable oh i can be a leader too and uh reach out to folks that you wouldn't have um, thought about and question and try to challenge yourself to really go out of your way to be inclusive and learn um you know uh, this is something i tell myself learn from others uh people are not what they seem at the first glance they have a lot more to offer um so i you know i say this to myself and to many of us uh, to continue to grow and um, challenge our uh, assumptions that we all hold based on our experiences And shining that spotlight on women founders, their achievements, their stories is something I really resonate with as well. When I came into Invest Auto in this role, if you looked at the website and the stories that we were telling five years ago versus the website, the stories, the social, and that's all attributed to a huge heavy lift and a lot of collaboration from my colleagues, all of whom are joining us today, but it's with intention and everything has been overhauled. We went from 10% women mentors in our venture development program to 50 Um, We're showcasing women founders from every walk of life in so many impactful ways. And that's because our venture team and all our collaborators are helping us to build that pipeline up. So we have those stories to tell so that we can help grow and inspire others. It's it's a wonderful, almost virtuous cycle, if you will, but it takes time and it takes intention and investment. So just really resonate with that. Michelle, I had the privilege of joining your round table. You hosted networking events where there was all kinds of mentors present one year ago virtually in this pandemic world. I know that that women in automotive tech are making investments in building up that talent pipeline and supporting the next generation. Any insights from you before we move to our final question? So Women in Auto Tech is a volunteer organization. So I think the most important thing is to build a community. And I think it's really also to just have fun and show your passion because I think passion is contagious. And I think we want to be honest with ourselves. You know, we want to be Um, you know, we want to talk about our struggles, but I think it's just to share and build a community. Um, So yeah, again, you know, passion is, I think that's what we're looking for. And um, in our organization, anybody who's interested in automotive transportation, mobility technology, we're, we're welcoming. You were very welcoming. So I remember reaching out to you at Christmas in 2019 before this pandemic had hit uh, and you you welcomed us with open arms at Ariex.O and I could not be more grateful. So a huge shout out and thank you to you and Michelle Avery for that. And we love working with you. (laughs) Well, as we conclude today, we have a couple of minutes left. I'd love to hear from each of you about your vision for an inclusive smart mobility future. Leave us with some some wonderful parting words that allow our audience to go away and think about what their vision is and how they can help to realize it in their sphere of influence. I can start. I think ensuring everyone feels like they can contribute is so, so important. I think, um, Christine, you, you were the one talking about bias and really challenging yourself to learn more about someone people we never know someone's story and everyone has so much more to offer than we think and when i hear about people leaving organizations 
it's always because they feel like they had a lot more to offer or they weren't able to contribute. And in my most frustrating times, it was the same thing. I felt like you're not hearing me. You don't see what I can do. I've got so much more to give. So I would just encourage us all to really be focused on our own bias, um, standing up for each other, being advocates for each other, and really pulling together to create an environment where everyone feels like they can contribute. Amazing, fulfilling potential and impact. I love it. What a beautiful message. Christine, your vision for an inclusive, smart mobility future, someone who's leading new technology mm -hmm. development innovation. Yeah, as I think about autonomy, this is a pivotal moment in the history of mobility and trans transportation where I think we're buying two things. One, freedom. Uh, freedom to do other things. Freedom from having to drive my kids around. That's one example where um, because there's a labor shortage of bus drivers and truck drivers, especially buses, school buses are very expensive. So I know constantly I get pinged by um, the school saying, hey, parents, can you drive? And in this case, parents end up being moms, right? Most of them moms uh, to drive to different activities, drive to field trips. Um, and this is where, um, yeah, moms are busy. They can do a lot of things and that gives us freedom. And then time, you know, 24 hours a day, um, you know, we spend a lot of time commuting. How do we make that uh, a more worthwhile time to fulfill our interests? I could pick up a new hobby. I could go to that boot camp I've been pushing off. Um, so I do think that um, this, us be having a, a seat at the table to really think about the policy, the impact on how we work, how we go to um, school, work and play is really where the transformation is happening and all of us have a role to play such that I think somebody said earlier that, you know, the crash test dummies were, um, you know, standard white male uh, and only recently NHTSA had implemented using female. Females come in many different sh shapes and sizes too. So, hey, the more diverse, better outcome for all of us. So really excited about that. Incredible insight and so visionary. And thank you and to the team at Blue Space and the companies that are helping to drive forward on realizing some of those potential and that vision. Michelle. I mean, I see um, the future of smart mobility being more flexible and also democratic. Um, I think the old way of transportation was really created by kind of white men. I don't want to pick on them, but I think they were making the decision. I think I see in the future, you know, many different types of um, transportation methods and, you know, them being flexible to have all the fit all the needs that um, like a working mom would need. Amazing. This has been such an inspirational discussion. And when I think about my vision, when I look at the founders that we're serving through Ariex Auto, which we've coined the future plex of innovation and collaboration. So democratizing, as you just said, Michelle, all these capabilities that would be outside the reach of so many founders, fledgling startups, founders from every walk of life, putting them within their reach. Women that we're serving are really looking at that triple bottom line. That's one of the common threads that we see through the founders that we're supporting through the different programs that they're all addressing a different UN sustainability goal and how appropriate that we opened up with an amazing leader, Risha, from the UN that came to us through the board of Women in Automotive Tech and concluding with all of you speaking to that very same vision. It's not just about economic impact, it's social impact and environmental impact. And that's, I think, one of the great gifts that women leaders and founders have to give to this particular sector. I could not be more privileged to have been with all of you today in this journey and the lead up to the event. And I look forward to so much more collaboration with all of you. Thank you for taking the time, Michelle, Christine, and Cheryl for being with us and sharing your inspiration and your actionable insight with our audience today. Thank, Thank you for you the so much. Thank you. And I think we're now going to pull back up Rebecca to join Michelle and I as we wrap up. Rebecca, what an incredible day. Oh, Sonia, it was amazing. I have so many thoughts running through my head, but the most the most one I'm going to take um, share with you is empowering. When I look at the, the, the amazing women leaders that we had on today's panels, it was very empowering to listen to each of their perspectives, each of the different fields and things that they're working on. Mm -hmm. 
So true. I mean, I want to extend on behalf of Invest Auto and Ariax Auto, sincere thanks to all the speakers, women in automotive technology, MDK Business Law, our partners, our sponsors, Rebecca, you and the entire Ariax.O team that I'm privileged to collaborate with. This event was so special. We've never done an event where all the women leaders from Ariax.O come together and co-create something. And we did that today. Our investors, Michael Trombley, our CEO, who's an incredible, passionate champion for women and an advocate uh, for leaders. And of course, our project team, who I would be very remiss. They have been with me side by side throughout the entire month of International Women's Week, which is almost five weeks of integrated programming. Samantha White, our incredible event manager, Lindsay, Kelsey, Gray, Courtney, and Olivia, who jumped in on social media. They have truly been the horsepower behind everything we've done for International Women's Month. And I could not be more grateful for all of your leadership. Um, we are, of course, going to follow up with a survey to hear from you about the opportunities that were created today and share updates and a chance to engage more fully. Um, but before we wrap up, I really want to turn the microphone over to Michelle, who's been an incredible partner, uh, and hear from you about your takeaways from today. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Sonia and the Invest Ottawa and Area XO team for giving us an opportunity and this platform. I also want to thank my board, um, Richa, Sarah, and Natasha um, for, you know, helping pull off this event. Yes. Incredible collaboration. And it truly does take a village. <laughs> We know that firsthand, and I love the fact that we're creating not just an Ottawa community or a Canadian community, but a global community uh, of women helping women. And I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca, who's done a marvelous job today as our MC, um, and invite you to bring this to a close, Beck. Thank you, Sonia. I want to thank everyone for joining us for such an incredible event. It was very inspiring and so many takeaways from today. Smart mobility the intelligent transportation and mobility network, the connection of various mobility, sorry, the connection of various elements of technology and mobility, a rethinking of the transportation infrastructure that we use daily. I'm going to leave everyone with a quote from Horst Kohler. The future belongs to those who are the first to put the power of the sun into the tanks and overtake it with hydrogen or make progress without CO2. I wanna thank you everyone for joining us today and we welcome all feedback and comments and look forward to connecting in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beck. Thank you everyone, stay healthy and safe. We'll look forward to seeing you again very soon.